Okay. Hey, everybody. What's up? Welcome back to my channel, Holy Humanist. Um, I'm very excited for you all to be here today because we have the beginning of something very, very exciting happening. Um, so I've got a very, very special guest with me today, uh, Lloyd de Young, which I really hope I've said his last name correctly. <laughs> but um, yeah, so without further ado, I'm going to invite Lloyd um, onto the stream and he'll give you a quick introduction as to who he is. And then I'll also share his YouTube channel with you guys because Lloyd is doing absolutely incredible work. Um, putting the spotlight on these areas of Islam and Islamic history and pre-Islamic history that kind of weren't looked into and, you know, nobody's done a deep dive to this extent and then connected the, the dots, so to speak. So um, going by that same kind of reasoning and wanting to expose elements of Islam that, you know, myself as an ex-Muslim, we don't really go into much. We're kind of just dealing with source material. And me particularly, I deal with with how it affects and impacts women and the status of women in Islam. So I thought today we'd kind of delve into the historical side of things some more because I personally am so fascinated um, by this sphere of history in general and what happened and how it lent its beginnings to Islam as we know it today. So the presentation today is basically going to be setting the scene because um, this is one in a number of uh, presentations to because it is such a big topic to unravel, as I'm sure Lloyd will tell us. So today's uh, presentation is going to be primarily to set the scene, um, introduce you to some major events, to the languages, to the geography, what was going on, um, and basically how proto-Islam like begins to take shape in Arabia. So yeah, I hope you guys um, enjoy it as much as I will and you learn um, as much as I'm about to learn because this is purely educational for me as well. And we have kind of decided to make this a two hour stint. So we encourage that you have, if you have any questions um, on whatever we're talking about in that moment, then feel free to send them our way so we can address them in the moment. Um, and if they are slightly more in-depth questions, we might save them for the end if we've got some time, but we're not doing a separate Q&A at the end. So keep your questions coming if you have any when and as we go through the presentation. Right, okay, I've spoken enough. Today, Lloyd is gonna be hosting way more than me and I'm just gonna be chiming in wherever I feel the need and probably annoying him and picking his brain with some questions. Um, so without further ado, Lloyd, welcome and thank you so much for being here. No, thank you for the opportunity. I'm really glad to be here, Nuria. No problem at all. And I know we've obviously just uh, had a couple of uh, discussions off air. So I've started to kind of, you know, get to know you a bit better. But for my audience and for whoever's watching, would you mind just giving a quick introduction as to like just your background, who you are and why you're doing what you're doing? <laughs> uh, certainly. Yeah. OK. Um, my name is Lloyd de Jong. I'm South African. I live in Warsaw, Poland. I lived 11 years in the Middle East. I've traveled extensively across the Middle East. Um, and for a significant portion of that time, I worked in national defense. So I was involved in engineering and consulting, designing long range wide area surveillance systems to protect borders and critical national infrastructure from, from sabotage, from terrorism. So basically preventing groups like Al Qaeda, ISIS from attacking critical resources like airports, oil pipelines, um, things of that nature, and basically destroying them, even military bases, military targets, destroying them, killing people. So I traveled across the Middle East. I consulted and worked with um, government, industry, law enforcement, and military. So I was very intimately involved with what was going on in the Middle East, very much intimately, intimately involved with the culture. I've traveled extensively. So, and, um, a lot of these experiences left me scratching my head and I wanted to understand the culture. And it took me a while to understand and I started to, and then uh, the one experience that changed me was I, I studied counterterrorism, and on the course we, we did, we did secular terrorism, you know, sort of terrorism for political reasons. Then we did religious, then we did a module on religious terrorism. And they were happy to talk about Hindu terrorists. And then we spoke about Christian terrorists, all those evil Christian terrorists. And then when it came to Islamic terrorism, it was like, oh, well, I'm not my minor issue. Let's just skip over that. Moving on to the next topic. Right. And I was like, hold, hold up. Can we talk about this? 
<laughs> and the staff and the faculty were terrified of discussing the topic. And there were numerous students that were there, it seemed specifically for the purpose of derailing any discussion, crying Islamophobia and then complaining and reporting anyone who wanted to raise this issue to the faculty. Right. And the faculty were terrified into submission. And eventually um, a cache of documents was discovered in Raqqa. Um, basically, they're, they're the indoctrination manuals. Right. And so the, so the ISIS manuals that I found that I had access to at the time, they were all standard Orthodox Sunni Islam. It wasn't anything strange. And I looked deep into this and I discovered one of their main documents, one of the books that they worked with, or Duro, well, was a Sharia manual called Reliance of the Traveler. And I started to read into it and I started to study and I became very familiar with the Islamic law, the fiqh, the Sharia. And I got banned from the class when I introduced this information that was seized in Raqqa to the class. Wow. And wow. that set me off. Wow. This is, uh, I mean, you've lived an extremely, I'd say, well, just eventful life. And is it fair to say then, Lloyd, like based on all your experience, you've spent time and lived amongst various kinds of Muslims across the Middle East. And yeah, you've seen... a significant time. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So... I mean, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I do want to just uh, point out Lloyd's channel. Sorry. Uh, this is Lloyd's YouTube channel. Um, let me click on the video link here. So please do go ahead and subscribe if you haven't already. By the end of this stream, I'm sure you would have. Um, as you can see, Lloyd is unpacking various like spheres of pre-Islam, the Islamic Sharia, fiqh, as he mentioned. Um, so there's a lot going on here. The Muslim Talmud that really deep dives into Sharia law in a way that myself as a lay Muslim, but even most people who think they know Sharia, um, it, it really, really makes you think again. So yeah, his channel is literally his name, Lloyd De Young. Please go ahead and subscribe to that. Oh, thank um, you for that. I appreciate it. No worries at all. So Lloyd, as I said, um, the floor is pretty much yours. Um, so you can steer this entire stream, to be honest, and I'll just kind of be here chiming in. But just before we get started, um, I just want to highlight why we are discussing this, because obviously it, when we've talked off air as well, we discussed like how some of these elements might be considered quite conspiratorial conspiratorial amongst Muslims and also amongst ex-Muslims alike. So right at the beginning of the show, before we've even started, um, Jojo is a regular viewer. Um, but Jojo says, I respect you and everyone who wants to help people, but this moon otheism is <laughs> nonsense. I say it as an ex-Muslim. And then I just want to show the varied opinion. Um, Rianon Sese, sorry if I've mispronounced your name, says, I'm also an ex-Muslim. There is a lot of truth behind it, to be honest if it's about what I think it is. So as you can see, there is already that kind of divide and what, we do, what we're delving into, is it actually, are the links there? Can we make a justifiable connection? And is there, you know, it, is, it does it have weight to it enough for us to make these links that we're making? So if you wanted to quickly sh shed some light on that and then the floor is all yours. Um, I, I think the fact that I'm here that you invited me onto the channel is testament to the fact that at least you think it is credible that that is credible and worthy of presenting, that you don't think it's crackpot. Yeah. Otherwise, I think you, you have a fair de degree of discernment. I've watched several of your videos now, and you you wouldn't bring me on if you thought that I was going to embarrass you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate Well, again, your research and your knowledge speaks for itself. So it's yeah. not even about, you know, it, it's literally hard hitting. And that's why I'm saying, if even yeah. if you think this, Jojo, at, the, in, at this instance, please let us know what you think at the end of this stream and, and most definitely at the yeah. end of the entire series. No, like, I will be introducing, also, this is information from the South. Uh, we're talking most research at the moment into early Islam, the Islamic origins, tends to focus around the 6th and 7th centuries. I go back well before that, hundreds of years, maybe a thousand years prior to that. Thank you, Clear as Mud. And I focus on the southern area, Yemen and Ethiopia. So I, I will introduce, I'll start with Ethiopia, then we'll move to Yemen very rapidly and stick with Yemen for most of this presentation. And, but also, so everyone's focusing on the north to pet places like Petra, Mesopotamia, Iraq, Turkey. Um, most of what I do focuses on the south, on the areas that were very close to that region um, historically, but also I look at archeology, span I look at the language, we look at lots of archeological research. So, 
and I will tie this together. So it's a lengthy series, but yeah, I think the, the evidence is clear. And another thing is that um, um, I've covered this within my discussions on Sharia, but Islamic law makes it legal. It's, it's not only legal, it is moral to lie. Islam, Islamic law allows Muslims to lie. Now, this is not to say that all Muslims are lying, and this is not to say that Muslims are knowingly lying. But also, this makes it legal for the imam to lie to Muslims. Because as long as they keep the peace, any lie that they tell is not considered a lie. It's considered righteous and moral. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of, there's lots of confusion. And, and this is a subject we can cover another day in depth. Sure. But, but unfortunately, so it, it really, so hence I'm, I'm going to be relying on numerous. And also I will share all of my resources. All my resources, I'll share the link. I'll provide that so you can make it available. All the resources that I'm using, everyone can go and have a look for themselves. Yeah. I have an archive of over 1,200 books that I use. Well, thank you, Lloyd. We really appreciate that because, again, we're not here to say, you know, believe us and trust every word we're saying here. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead and look into it for yourselves. That That's literally what we're encouraging. And I think you're, or, I mean, even just us having this conversation is already starting to, I mean, Jojo has now said, yeah, in a way, maybe. I mean, Yah from Christianity has the same name as the Egyptian moon god Yah and Allah comes from the Jewish god Yah. So, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, well, this is all the kind of stuff we're going to unpack because Lloyd has so many more connections and links to draw here. So thank you, Jojo, for reconsidering your position and being willing to be open to this knowledge. So yeah, let's do this. Okay, well, yeah, so let me, um, so yeah, let me share my present. Let me just start by sharing the presentation. I may as well just take it from the top. Um, sure. And as you said, we'll take questions, we'll meander a little bit. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> So guys, feel free to send your questions through on if you have a question as and when Lloyd is presenting on a specific um, issue or topic. Okay, yeah. Can everyone see my screen? So I should be yes. sharing now. Yes, here we are. Okay, here we are. So so thank you everyone for being here. Thank you again, Nuria, for inviting me. Hi to all those guys who know me in the chat. Appreciate your attendance. Right, have a look. This is called Islamic monotheism. I, I know this has been an issue, a content, well, very contentious issue since the 90s when this theory was floated, but we're going to go into far more depth than uh, you may be familiar with. And we're going to talk about the moon gods of Babylon because early Islam, proto-Islam, that, that region before the birth of Muhammad, they worshipped a pantheon of gods. And this pantheon of gods happened to be a clone of the Babylonian pantheon of gods. So we'll right. be focusing on Yemen mostly. We will cover Ethiopia. We'll be talking about Abraham because Islam claims to be of the religion of Abraham. Now, if you look at the biblical story, Abraham, before he started to worship Yahweh, Abraham was a Sabaean. He was mm -hmm. a moon worshiper. And the Sabaeans are from Yemen. So the Queen of Sheba, the people of the Queen of Sheba, Saba. So he was a moon worshiper. And Abraham was one of these people who worshipped the moon. So the, so the original, and since, since in Islam, they reject Christianity, they reject Judaism, and they wanted to find the original religion of Abraham, while well, the original religion of Abraham was moon worship. And don't they also <clears throat> reject, is that the same Sabians that's referred to in the Quran at least three times? Uh, there's two. So, so it's, a, it's a little unclear in the Quran because they have, you, have this, you have the Sabians and you have the Sabians. They're two yes. different groups. Okay. So there's a little bit of a difference. We will cover that. We will get into sure. that in depth. So yeah, but also you'll see here the symbol, this crescent and star. The star is often round without the without the the the, the spikes on the star because that's the star Venus. Okay, you can see this symbol goes way back. And I know Muslims like to say that the Turkish did it in 1843, became the symbol of the Ottoman Empire. No, mm -hmm. the Turks were using this symbol pre BC. They were using this in the first century. They were using it up to you know several hundred years before Jesus was born. So wow. this symbol goes way back in Turkey. But so anyway, thank you guys. Let's let's all begin. So just to give a brief summary of the overall thesis, we're going to be looking at archaeology, history, language, as well as the Islamic sources. Right? We're going to be looking at proto-Islam and how it is traced to Yemen and to Ethiopia and into into their pagan roots. Right. They had the same religion. They had the same pagan Babylonian roots. Proto-Islam is based on pagan moon god worship. So that's the overall thesis here. And I'll be discussing that in depth. The Arabian gods were copies of the Babylonian, Sumerian, and Canaanite gods. They were all effectively the same wow. pantheon of gods. Right. As we know, there's no early evidence of Mecca in Arabia. 
There right. is evidence for many Meccas in Yemen. And the Arabian pagan god, the main Arabian pagan god was called Makkah. Wow. <laughs> How right. insane in is that? Correct. And Makkah was also known as the Babylonian moon god Sin, the main god of Babylon, the moon god. And so, yeah, so let's, <clears throat> so let's start here. So this is where I start. Hopefully this is a slower introduction. So just, just setting the scene. And in the second and third um, presentation, this really starts to pick up pace. Yeah. But we're talking about Yeha. It's a Sabaean or Saba kingdom site in Ethiopia. <clears throat> Yeha is a Bronze Age site near Aksum in Ethiopia. It is the largest archaeological site in the Horn of Africa, which shows African contact with South Arabia. As I said, most research focuses on the north and on the east, northern Iraq, and so on, and Turkey. However, very, very little work has been done looking at Yemen and looking at Africa. So now Saba is the historical Sabaean kingdom of Sheba from the Solomon, the stories of Solomon and the queen, queen of Sheba. Sheba. Correct. From the Quran <laughs> itself, yeah. Discusses that legend, yeah. So Yeha is the precursor to the Ethiopic Aksumite Empire, which interestingly enough was the fourth, one of the four greatest empires of its day, and few people have even heard of it. Th these people were competing with the Greeks, the Romans, the Chinese. They were on the same par wow. as these major, major empires, but n you've barely heard of them. Exactly, yeah. Right. So this site was established in the 8th century BC. It includes a temple, an elite residence called the Great Belgebri, and some shaft tombs cut into rock. And the Sabaeans were a Semitic people from an Arabian kingdom in western Yemen. So actually, let me bring up my bring up a map just so I can orient people a little more closely to this. Sure. So this is the region that we are referring to here. Right, so this is what we are referring to here. This is Ethiopia. So this is Aksum here. This used to be, obviously, historically, things have changed over time, but this is in the north of Ethiopia, just across the strait from wow. Arabia. Yeah. And this is very near the Horn of Africa. So <clears throat> we'll come back to the maps on regular occasions. Yeah. So now the empire flourished from the 8th century BC to about 275 AD. They were conquered. They did come back in, in spurts, but the culture, the general culture, continued for a long time after that. And this temple was known as El Makkah, temple wow okay now what is interesting to note is that the yemeni arabic has this q sound maqa whereas in in arabian arabic it becomes a hard k so maqa yeah. becomes maka right you may have heard of a small town in arabia called maka uh, yeah i've heard of it before <laughs> yes right. oh my gosh so this was the maka temple now what is interesting is this was only one of many maka temples uh, these are two more Makkah temples right here. And I'm Mara, sorry, Lloyd, even just Yemen. immediately, straight away, geographically, this makes so much more sense, doesn't it? From if you're looking at Saudi Arabia today and to, to what's happening in this region, then like where you say, obviously, Petra is like a strong candidate, according to some people. But, you know, what's happening up in Iraq and stuff, this this I mean, even if you look at into the Islamic African slave trade, it all starts to make more sense. You'll notice that the very same criteria that make Petra an acceptable candidate apply to Yemen and possibly even more so. Most definitely. I agree. So we'll look a little bit more into that. We'll touch on all of that. So there were several Makkah major te temples, major pilgrimage temples in this part of Yemen and Western Arabia, right here, Southwestern Arabia. The capital at one point was here in Marib. Okay? It was also known as the throne of the Queen of Sheba. Mahram Bilkis, right? Mm -hmm. And so these are two of them. There was a third one close by. So these were three of the major Makkah temples right here in Arabia. As you can see, Mecca is up here, and then you've got this area right here. This Najran was a was at one point a Christian location, but it had the interesting name of of um, of Arabia Heresium Ferax, which was Arabia the bearer of heresies. So oh. what happens is Christianity, so oddly enough, Christianity, and this is all important, we'll tie it in, Christianity came to Ethiopia very early on. So from the second century, there was already an established Christian presence. However, at one point, these guys controlled all of Arabia, 
which includes that influence up to Mecca. So they brought their Christian influence, even in Ethiopic Bible, much earlier than was expected. And this was one of the hotspots where Christians would go and do their pilgrimage. However, heretics, major heretics also gathered here. Gnostics also gathered here. There was a huge right. fight to establish orthodoxy here. Right. Okay. Right. So here we go. So now you've got Aksum and you've got Yeha, right? Then you've got various al makkah temples multiple temples in this region and that's najran and of course mecca is just up here all right so i'll continue <clears throat> so let's have a look at the sabaeans so the people of the kingdom of Saba, the kingdom of sheba so muslim writer muhammad shukri ala lusi i believe his 10th century he compared their religious practices to islam in his bulug al-arab fi ahwal al-arab he said that arabs during the pre-islamic period during the jahadiyya used to practice things that were included in the Islamic Sharia. Oh, my word. They, for example, did not marry both a mother and her daughter. They considered marrying two sisters simultaneously to be the most heinous crime. They censured anyone who married his stepmother. They made the major Hajj and the minor Umrah pilgrimage to the Kaaba. They performed Correct. the circumambulation around the Kaaba Tawaf. They ran seven times between Mount Safa and Marwa. They threw rocks and they washed themselves after sexual intercourse. Is that familiar? Yes, insanely. Oh my days. That is literally the And this is the summary. Hajj. Yeah, exactly. That's literally Hajj, the mini version, Umrah, um, the washing yourselves after sexual intercourse. It's in what, so many of the hadith, exactly what and how many times you should wash and all that. This is literal Islam today. Correct. And these were pagan Babylonian moon god worshippers. Wow. So they also goggled. They sniffed water up into their noses. They clipped their fingernails, removed all pubic and performed ritual circumcision. They also cut off the right hand of a thief and they stoned adulterers. Hmm, sounds Again, a little familiar too. Yeah, modern Islam. Literally, that's how you do wudu or, you know, the ablution before you pray. And that's still a, um, a punishment in the Sharia. Correct. Yeah, we can do Sharia another time, but yeah, I can certainly. So now the Sabaeans have five prayers similar to the five prayers of the Muslims. Others say they have seven prayers, five of which are comparable to the prayers of the Muslims. With regards to time, that is morning, noon, afternoon, evening, and night. And the sixth is at midnight, and the seventh is at forenoon. So some sects of the Sabaeans had five prayers. Yeah. Not all of them. Some had seven, but some had five. Five prayers. Uh, do you know of another religion that has five prayers? I, I can't think of one right now. Uh, I don't know. I believe it might be the one I came from. <laughs> Islam, but also um, Lloyd, the, the even if it's seven, that's really interesting as well, because in Islam, technically, if you want to be that extra good Muslim, you can pray um, the further one. It's called the Hajj. It's, it's even before Fajr, the sunrise one. And then you can pray, pray one after Isha as well, which is either five or seven, if you think yeah. about it. Madness. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it is their practice to pray over the dead without kneeling down or even bending the knee. They also fast for one lunar month of 30 days. They start their fast at the last watch of the night and continue till the setting of the sun. Some of their sects fast during the month of Ramadan. I've heard that name somewhere before. They face the Kaaba when they pray. They venerate Mecca and believe in making pilgrimage to it. They consider dead bodies, blood and the flesh of pigs as unlawful. They also forbid marriage for the same reason as do Muslims. Oh my gosh. Again, Islam today. That's it still. Yeah. They have they have assimilated this very well into current Islam as we know it. It's all still there. And it just so Ramadan, that being a sacred month, pigs being unlawful, all of this is pre-Islamic. It's not it, yeah. it's and it's and it's from this how do I pronounce this one right without alluding to the other one? Surveillance? The bands, yeah. The bands. bands. Yeah, the other ones are Sabians. Let me just bring up this. So, yeah, the the other group would be Sabians. Whoops. Uh, Sabians. Right. Yeah, these guys are Sabians. But we're talking okay. about Sabians right now from Yemen. The Sabians are in the north. The, the Sabians are both groups. Okay, this group is mentioned in the Bible. They're part of the biblical history. They're enemies of the people of, oof, well, the people of Israel, right? They're enemies of the people of Israel. And they actually are servants of Satan within the biblical story. And then the Sabians are what we call the Mandaeans today. They're Gnostics. Okay. They detest Jesus. They hate Jesus. They revere John the Baptist and they follow the prophet Enoch. They call him right. Enosh. But there's a longer story there, but that's, yeah. Sure. So um, also just don't want, uh, I saw a comment in the chat, Darse, Atheist Republic of Cape Town, Homeo. 
but um, that's Afrikaans. So yeah, but it's also important that you don't mishmash everything so that it, there's no distinctions between them because there are distinctions to be made. It's very important to also recall to think about the distinctions, not just the similarities. So, okay, let's move on. So in Bulukharab fi blah, 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 we read the four sacred months, Rajab, Dual Qadda, Dual Hijja, and Muharram had been considered sacred during the pre-Islamic period, the Jahiliya. There were raids. There was taking revenge. Well, Kias, war, fighting, and disputes were forbidden during them. If a man met his enemy who killed his father or brother, he would not quarrel with him during the sacred months. Whoa. The people were under restriction not to fight or make raids and had to remove their spearheads as a sign that they would avoid fighting at all costs. And obviously, Islam borrowed the hallowing of these months from pre-Islamic Arabs and introduced nothing new into the world. That's Abdullah Abdul Fadi is the Quran infallible, page 127. Wow. These are additional pagan practices that are part and parcel of Islam, Quranic Islam today. Still, exactly. There's actually that entire Quranic verse about not fighting during the sacred months. It's literally verbatim in the Quran. Yeah. So, yeah. So there you go. So let's continue. So let's talk now. I'm going to sort of introduce, I will generally introduce something and then I'll move on to something else, introduce that because I'm putting the pieces on the board as it were. Sure. Right. So I won't necessarily go into depth on anything. This is like an overview session. So let's look at our Makkah. Okay. It's a proper mm -hmm. noun. It is Semitic. It is Sabaean. And one of its roots is LMQH, a muk. Right. You will notice that these gods of the different pantheons have multiple names. Sometimes mm -hmm. they, they, they change gender. On occasion, they even change gender. It's the same God. They just gender swap for some reason. Right. But, and they can have many names. Often, it's not a different God under a different name. It's just that, l let's say you need water because you live in a dry part of the world. So, so you your God has many qualities. So you revere the quality of rain. So he's your rain God, and you call him by his rain name. Someone else might have lots of rain, but they need, I don't know, safety or defense or something. So they, they revere that aspect of him. That's why there's multiple names, the qualities of Allah, but that's a future story. So you can see here's his name gotcha. in, in the Sabaean language, and this is in Ethiopic or Gez, the Ethiopian language. You can see it's very similar because the original Ethiopic, these glyphs from, from the Sabaean language made their way to Ethiopia. The Ethiopians developed a far more sophisticated language, which then when they conquered Yemen, so Yemen conquered, conquered Ethiopia, the language developed, the script improved, and then these guys conquered Yemen, and then they conquered Arabia, and the language, and every sound within Arabic is contained within the Ethiopian language. Wow, okay. All right, and in fact, Ethiopian, this Ethiopic, is the closest of all the Semitic languages to Arabic. Okay, so we can say that that was the precursor to even the Qureshi dialect of Arabic. It may well be yeah. the case. Yes. Okay. So, oh, so what? Okay. Actually, now that you bring that up, let me show you this. This is from the book Foreign Words in the Quran by Arthur Jeffrey. I'm just going to bring this up. It's the Foreign Vocabulary of the Quran by Arthur Jeffrey, PhD, Professor of Semitic Languages, School of Oriental Studies, Studies Cairo. Right. Mm -hmm. So I've just made a table out of what is in the book, and you can see these are words in the Quran from different languages. Because wow. I know the I know the Quran. Allah claims that it's. It's just pure Arabic, but you'll notice we have Syriac, Aramaic, Hebrew, Greek, Ethiopic, Persian, Akkadian, South Arabian, Armenian, Phoenician, Mandaean, Sanskrit, Nabataean, Latin. Wow. So you can go down this list. There's a number of foreign words in the Quran. Okay. There's Jeez. a number. And it's interesting to see how, like, how high of a proportion the Syriac words are as well. Yeah, certainly. And the Ethiopic. Now, this table is based on what's in the book. I, I, In this sense, it's uncritical. I simply took what was in the book. But I can say that Ethiopic and Amharic here can be glommed together as one language. So if, just for the sake of right. convenience, make them one language. Then they start to match more or less Greek. And I can tell you there are words now that are, that are known to be Ethiopic that are in Arabic that are not in this list. Oh, are not wow. In the book. Okay. Right? So the Ethiopic would then count more than the Greek, the Ethiopic influence. And also, if you look at the Coptic influence, for instance, if the Quran, if the Northern influences were so strong, then you'd have more Coptic. Right? Very the Coptic true. is only 10 words. Yeah. Especially if Ethiopic moves up in the way you're saying, then that, that would make so much sense as well. Yeah. So there's good reason for that. So there's lots of reasons. Yeah. So clearly there was influence from both North 
and south. So what I'm hoping to do is to provide what happened in the south and then connect it to what's happening in the north so you can see the bridge between them, how they merged. Right. right. So by the way, this is available. I will give you the link to this so that everyone can actually have this. It's on my community page. If you scroll down, you'll find it. Otherwise, I'll give you the link. We can drop it in a comment or pin comment in the chat later, all my resources for everyone to um, have a look for themselves. Yeah, sure. And I can okay. add them to the description as well. So you guys can also sure. go and verify all of this on your, in your own time. Yep. Yeah, I have an, my entire archive. Uh, I have a number of PhD papers. I have a number of scientific papers and books, references, academic papers. I will be th that I've drawn this from. So, amazing. Thank you, Lloyd. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Al Makka is a moon god once worshipped in Yemen, in Saba, or what we know as Sheba, and also in Ethiopia, in Aksum. Okay. The synonyms are Al Makka, Al Muk, as, as well as many, many other names. These are just two of them. Al Muk is the same as Al MQH. Right. Okay. Right. So the Sabaean capital was Marib, 120 kilometers east of Sana'a in Yemen, and they were a seafaring people. They built great irrigation works, they built castles, they built temples, and they were a large trading empire. For hundreds of years, they were a very influential, very wealthy trading empire. The British Museum called them the oldest and most important of the South Arabian kingdoms to, with, during an exhibition that they once had. Oh, damn, and okay. This, yeah, and they are known in the Arabic as Sabayun. Unfortunately, if you look at some of the translations, they only say the Saba. So you don't know whether they're talking about the Sabaeans or the Sabaeans. So unfortunately, there's that ambiguity there. There's that. Either way, it's a problem for Islam, but we'll get into that yeah. later. Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> now let's continue. So this, of course, is Marib here in Yemen. This is Sana. Najran will be up here. And then, of course, this would be Ethiopia. And so you can see this is the rough geography we're working with right now you can see the strait is very short so it's easy to get across here yeah okay so let's look at some other al makka temples if they're great seafaring people as well you know <laughs> yes they were so they were dedicated these temples were dedicated to al makka if you need me to slow down just let me know when we want to go back just let me know sure so I there were like several al makka pace. temples yeah sorry good i feel like the pace is perfect but yeah sorry do continue okay thanks so, dedicated to a Makkah, the moon god of Saba, this temple measured 40 by 60 feet. That's important because we will find something else that, that links to that again in the near future. So, being Sabaean, it is similar to the temples of the Sabaean kingdom, such as the Al Makkah temple of Sirwa and the Al Makkah temple, known as the Awan temple in Marib. There's also another temple called a Marib tem temple close by, just, just a name. So, after Marib, Serwa was the most important economic and political center of the Kingdom of Saba at the start of the first century BC, right? And in front of the building was a platform with six pillars called a propylon. These pillars are called propylon in ancient practice, right? Religious practice. And there was great bel Gebri, the palace, and which also had six pillars once. Guess, think of another building in the center of Mecca, which once also had six pillars inside it. The Kaaba? Correct. The Kaaba once also had six pillars inside it. I'll just this show you briefly uncanny. here. Yeah. Right. If we go here, let's have a look. Sahih Muslim. Allah's apostle entered the Kaaba, and in it there were six pillars, and he stood near a pillar, and he made supplication. Oh, my word. Literally the exact, exact same setup from Today, Sahih Muslim. Guys, this again, mm -hmm. it's it, this is well. the Islamic source right there. It's in Sahih. Well, actually, I call them Da'if Muslim and Da'if Bukhari because whenever you show these to a Muslim, they'll tell you that's Da'if, brother. <laughs> I love that. I literally, I have heard you use that before and I was like, spot on. I love that. Da well, I just Mus call them Da'if Muslim and Da'if Bukhari <laughs> because, man, it's <laughs> whatever. So the palace once had six pillars. Okay. We'll talk about this now. So Yeha has been identified as a pre-Aksumite occupation based on 19 inscriptions on stone slabs, altars, and seals found at Yeha, all written in South Arabian script. Right now, everything we talk about, I'm gonna expand in the future. So I'm introducing them now, and I will touch on these, be, be it minutes or hours from now, I'll be touching on these. Right? Okay, cool. So these are all things we need to just bear in mind as you're telling us now, because they will yeah, pop I'll up I'll be coming later. back to these, and I'm just laying these down, yeah. Okay. So these are the eight pillars of the Awam al Makka temple in Marib. Okay, right. these are the eight pillars. What's important is not the eight pillars. What's important are the seven spaces. Okay. Because you have seven prayers. These are the, these are the entrances oh, to get see. to God. 
to go through yeah. that space to get to God, to get to Allah in this case. Okay. It's that. So yeah. this is how you enter into the holy place. You go through the space. So there are seven spaces, seven prayers. Understand? Oh, wow. So Fascinating. Look at this one. It has six. This one is broken. You can see this one's broken off here. But yeah. one, two, three, four, five, six. I, as you know, I'm, I'm African. So if I want to count more than 10, I have to take off my shoes and socks. So <laughs> at least now I can one, you know. So moving on. So. <laughs> So your accent, African I love the South African accent as well. I think, oh, I could listen to it all day. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, so yeah, African education is very bad. I attended a school for emotionally disturbed teachers. So uh, forgive me if any of that comes. <laughs> <laughs> it was a joke. So, um, but notice there are six pillars here. And obviously these guys prayed seven times a day. These guys prayed five times a day. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's like a very just a variation, like denominations within the within the religion. So about this location, it was clearly a royal site under the Mukarabs. This word will come to much later, but this is an important word. The okay. Mukarabs, probably directly under a king. Okay, they speak of Najran, which is in Arabia. That was where the Christians were concentrated, and where heresy was concentrated. The Gnostics were concentrated. I see. The town of Sirwa seems on language-based evidence to have early contained speakers of Arabic. So obviously Arabs were also in Yemen and the Yemenis at one point controlled all of Arabia. They conquered mm -hmm. and controlled multiple times all of Arabia. The town played no role in Islamic times, but its site became a great mythic one for Islamic historians. It was very important to them in their myths, in their stories of the past. Very um, interesting. As an oral culture, as an oral yeah. culture, they would obviously tell stories and poems and they have frequent citations of poetry mentioning it. Wow, okay, so because they important. were also big on poetry at that at that time. It was an oral culture, and even the you know just the way the the way the Quran is recited comes from their their po like poetry and the tonality they used to use. Well, which was like their internet. Yeah, 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 exactly. And if they're alluding to things that have happened here, that's insanely interesting. Yeah. So, so this again, just to let you know, this is. Abyssinia, Ethiopia. This is the, the locations we just spoke of. This is a couple of the locations we're alluding to, and that's Najran, just so you know. And this area called Hadramaut, here you've got so Yemen, Arabia, and Mecca is right up there. Okay, so let's mm -hmm. continue. So let's look at our Wam temple. Let's go to the Smithsonian Museum. So Kirks. they funded this visit. He's, I think his father went, and then his father died, and then they funded him, and he went many decades later. Wendell Phillips and his team excavated the great walled enclosure of Mahram Bilkis, which is the name for the Queen of Sheba, the ancient temple of Awam dedicated to the moon god al -Makkah. Wow. So she worshipped the moon god al -Makkah. Tribal unrest in the area halted efforts in 1952. Decades later, they invited Marilyn Phillips and so on to continue. This is dated 2014. Now, the reason I specifically say moon god al makkah and I will bring many, many references to that effect, is that Islamic apologists want to claim that he's not a moon god. They want to make other claims. But that's a very specious claim. It's based on faulty information. So, yeah. <clears throat> so now we know al makkah was a moon god. Now, let's have a quick look at the Raja Jil columns. Now, some places you'll see Raja Lil, other places Raja Jil. So I just, right. you know, so I use them both. These are columns. These are stelae. So archaeologists working in Saudi Arabia continue to puzzle over the meaning of more than 50 groups of oddly arranged standing stones, megaliths, the most famous of which are found at the site of Rajajil near the ancient oasis town of Al Juf, right? That's up here. Mm -hmm. This is in Arabia. So Mecca is here. This is the southern tip of Arabia. And there we go. This up here, top right. They date to the Chalcolithic period, which is 4,500 to 3,500 B.C., that's like six, 7,000 years ago, yeah. depending on some of the dates. So I've used like a conservative date here. Raised more than 5,500 years ago by an unknown people. Many pillars are now fallen. Others are tilting heavily. They were erected in Saudi Arabia's al Juf province during the fourth millennium before Christ. That's interesting because this location is very close to Petra. And again, all of this will be connected. I'll show you how this is important. These are some of these columns. Right. right? These are some of the columns. Now, I know that you're an atheist channel. Many people, obviously, your followers are generally atheists, not religious. But it's not it's not important that that they believe. It's important that they need to understand that the people that we are talking to believed this. Talking about, rather, the people that we're talking about, they believed this, right? Yeah, most so, definitely. 
Okay, so we need to understand that we need to look at it from their perspective. These people believe this stuff. So you exactly. can see an example of these standing stones. Here's another example of these standing stones, all broken, shattered, leaning, fallen, and so on. Also very weathered, right? Yeah. Aljuf was a significant stop of a point on several ancient trade highways. Trade highways are very important because that's how information was shared. And in fact, that's how Christianity spread, right? Religions mm -hmm. originally spread through trade routes. Yeah. So religious ideas, religious figures, words, language spread through trade routes, right? Mm -hmm. And these guys were going to Arabia, Egypt, Mesopotamia, and Syria. One trade route, one of the oldest land routes, ran from Yemen to Medina and then to Marin Saleh. And then went as far as Damascus and Turkey. Wow. Okay. And that is one of the oldest land routes recorded in history. So, wow. Okay. And look, yes. <laughs> look at the area it covers. Yeah. Because yeah, that, that's, that's what huge. people were saying, yeah. right? For a long, long time. Why was Mecca at that point not on any of the like most crucial trade routes? It wasn't even part of the trade route. And giving Muhammad this contextual history as uh, a trader who would come across so many people and stuff. And then it, Makkah's just missing. This this makes sense. The, the trade point started and ran from Yemen parallel to the Red Sea coast. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah correct. So we'll, we'll cover all of this. Everything I'm introducing, we'll go into more depth later. So, sure. okay, they obviously avoided this huge desert. If you, if you look here, there's this massive desert region. They had to avoid most of this, right? Totally uninhabited, uninhabitable. So I that think to even to this day, right? I mean, that might be called might, the empty I've quarter. Been those regions. I've, I've been in the man. I've spent. I've been. I've been in the middle of the Rubal Khali with the with the military. Yeah. It's incredible out there. It's 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 empty. It's literally but it's, it's harsh, but it's incredibly beautiful. I can't explain it. It's the most harsh, unforgiving, and most incredibly lonely but beautiful locations it's just amazing yeah i mean i've flown over it and even just seeing like it from like what well, just just the the how insanely the expanse of it but seeing it from the air was daunting enough i can't imagine being actually in in the thick of it but yeah again so basically yeah, no. the point was that there's a huge uninhabited, uninhabited space there in saudi arabia which is like harsh desert proper yeah. sand dune desert <laughs> yeah i can tell stories about that but so i want to mention that i'm just quoting what these scholars or what these articles state okay i'm not saying yeah. i necessarily believe what they're saying i'm just saying this is the sort of the academic thought okay i've got my own ideas based on for reasons the stones may have indicated the presence of a crossroads and the safer route to take okay and mm -hmm. they are an enigma okay but notice there's a there's a whole bunch of them close to each other okay we're going to get to later on to another religious site with a whole bunch of standing pillars close to each other, little circles of pillars, dozens of circles of pillars close to each other. Wow. Right? Okay. So here you can see more of these little pillars. This is one of the mysteries of Arabia. Now, understand, though, that there may have been things carved on these pillars that oh. are weathered away, or they may have been destroyed. So just bear that in mind. All right? Yeah. <clears throat> Which is so really is interesting because I was just doing a parallel. Sorry, I was just thinking yeah. of a parallel to like the Stonehenge and some of the earlier stone sites in in Britain, but again, mm -hmm. not with carvings of any kind. You know, it was more like the stone that they revered. But in this situation, if you're saying there could have potentially even been inscriptions on there that have been weathered away, that's mind boggling. Yeah, no, I'll, there's reasons why I'll, why I'm saying that. So we'll come to all of that. So now let's talk about pillars in architecture in, in, in religious history, right? Ancient religious history. So they're called papillae, the monumental gates or entranceways to a temple or a religious complex. They're a symbolic secular slash religious partition. You have to pass through the, and this was part then, at least in that context, okay? In that context, we're part of pagan ritual worship, right? right. So... In the Century Dictionary and Encyclopedia, it says in ancient Egyptian architecture, there were a monumental gateway, usually between two towers, like truncated pyramids. Okay, fine and well, the Egyptians did that. In Chambers' 20th Century Dictionary, it's monumental gateway before the entrance of an ancient Egyptian temple. Okay, so it's an Egyptian idea that someone liked, and it became popular. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay, let's have a look at this Egyptian temple, which has a gate, which has these uh, pillars, this false gateway into the entrance of the Egyptian temple. Sorry, no, that's not an Egyptian temple. That is in Jerusalem, I believe. And that is the mosque on the Dome of the Rock. That's Alexa, yeah. And that has so, 
this uh, okay so when it was first was that um that pre-pillar to the entrance of the mosque as you're discussing the propylon type copy paste was that there from the outset of the building of this mosque i don't know i haven't looked that deeply into it but okay. it certainly has one Oh my days, much to the Luxor itself testifies to that. And then notice we also have the same at this other entrance. You have another one right in front of the door. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pillars. Yep. With, Just okay. before you go. So you'll start to see these little parallels are running constantly. All right. So let's look at Aksum now. Aksum was one of four great powers alongside Rome, Persia, and China. So these guys rivaled Rome. They rivaled All Persia the and China. world's great powers that, yeah, at that time. Yeah. And then they disappeared. No one heard of them anymore. Just so, got, according yeah. to Mani, yeah. of the Manichaeans, right, he was the founder of Manichaeanism and he was a prolific writer. It had influence over Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, Arabia, Egypt, and extensive trade contacts with Asia and the Mediterranean. And the Aksumites developed Africa's only indigenous written script, Gez. Now, I can show a paper, which I might show later, is that the language of Gez, the Ethiopian language, the original Ethiopian language, is on the basis, as far as preserved languages go, it is the world's oldest language. It is wow. the oldest unchanged language in the world. So, in other words, even ancient Hebrew has changed. Like modern Hebrew and ancient Hebrew have changed significantly. So, some of the word forms can no longer be, be determined because the language has changed in the last five or 6,000 years. Whereas yeah. Gez, many of the original words are still there today. So, you, in mm -hmm. fact, you can trace the development of the language and other languages based off of Gez. Wow. And they okay. also have these. So, it's, it's more of a living language in that sense, uh, even more so than Hebrew is in terms of how we can still tra translate those exact words back. Yes, you can find those words, yeah. So they mentioned that the Sabaeans were in Africa around the millennium of the uh, middle of the first millennium before Christ, right? That's 500 BC, 700 BC. There were Sabaeans in the Horn of Africa, okay? In the realm of Axum, Eritrea, Ethiopia. And there are inscriptions and they mention the national cult of al Makkah, which we see in the, the Sabaean right. moon god. But they yeah. were mixed up with various non saban communities OK, although scholars aren't sure exactly how these these groups all interconnected, different religions, different languages. But they but clearly this was a, a group that was very much mixed in with other cultures. Mm -hmm. So this was a very, um, what would you say, ecumenical society that had lots of, you know, different people living within that same demographic. Yeah, so okay? pretty pluralistic well, with the late crossover. Thanks, thank you. That's the, mm -hmm. that's the word I was probably looking for. Right. And notice also this Aksumite stele right? Uh, there's just this mention, this paper is to investigate the origins of the Aksumite stele in the light of Near Eastern and African megalithism, standing stones like Stonehenge. Yeah. Because you will find as we get to the end of this presentation that the Kaaba has things that are in common with megaliths like Stonehenge. Mm -hmm. We will get to that, but that comes much later. Is that besides so instance, the fact that it even has the, the, the rock in it as well, the black stone? Because that's also yes. part of an extension of the stone veneration, I reckon. Yeah. Correct. So even in the Negev, right, third millennium BC, there are the Arcanes of flat stones, and also in Jordan. And Jordan is very important. We'll see later why. And there was a sanctuary devoted to the ancestor cult, okay, discovered at southern Jordan. So we'll talk about that, but it consists of a circle about 20 meters in diameter of stone slabs carved with male and female portraits. Okay. okay so this wow. this concept, this idea goes around a lot. Mm -hmm. So the Aksumite Empire, so according to National Geographic, the Aksumite Empire was a wealthy trading nation in northeastern Africa, right? Achieving prominence by the first century, unifying and controlling a large state and trade routes that were linked to the Roman Empire. In fact, they became the largest traders with the Romans. Wow. Right? And they were linked to the Middle East and India, and they are the ones who introduced Christianity to the rest of sub-Saharan Africa. Oh, wow. So you can imagine how much power they yielded at that time. Yeah, very much influential. Archaeologists have found evidence of a complex society called Diamat or Dimmit that preceded the rise of Aksum by several centuries, based in Yeha in the Tigray Highlands. Okay, so just wow. more confirmation evidence. Yeah. Now, this Dimmit, this means to, to mimic, to copy. Um, at least it seems to. At least it would seem that this word means this, and there's a reason for that. Um, again, everything. So it was positioned at the crossroads of trade routes from East African coast to the African interior. 
and trading partners included most of the major states in the known world, Egypt, South Arabia, the Middle East, India, and China. Wow, wow, wow. Right? The most important commercial partner was the Byzantine Romans. Okay. Right? And this was Axum. They controlled at least this area, if not much more to the east and more to the north. Mm -hmm. Okay? So they controlled this entire area here. At and as you can see, Mecca falls within that, the current Mecca, anyway. They were influential. They did not directly control Mecca, I believe, but they certainly influenced it from a political and from an economic standpoint. Heavy trade links. There were the guards would, would accompany the caravans. They would sell things, buy things. <clears throat> so certainly they had strong influence there. Right, let's look at some coins. So Axum was mm -hmm. the first African country to mint its own coins in gold, silver, and bronze, and also in the standard weight categories issued by the Roman Empire. So they wanted to play nice with Rome. Mm -hmm. So these coins have been recovered as far away as India, and they were the first Christian kingdom to put crosses on coins. Oh, right. Okay. So the reason I say this is, again, alluding to the future, is that um, Christianity came to Ethiopia about two or three hundred years earlier than scholars had previously suspected. Wow. And these Ethiopians were in Mecca, at least according to the standard narrative, they were in Mecca. Muhammad learned from them. He heard them recite the Bible. They had a Bible that was written in Gez long before there was an Arabic Bible and it was paraphrased into the Arabic. Well, even so, like Warwick of Nofal was known to be uh, a Gnostic or uh, a Christian heretic of some sort, a right? Or yeah. something of the nature, yeah. Mm. Which just shows yeah, you, obviously, we'll... he was surrounded by, by various different types of Christians and Jews at that time. And early on, now look, the, again, this is, we're looking back in history, but early in the day, these guys were effectively, they weren't, I wouldn't say they were Unitarians, but the way that they defined their belief in the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and so on, you know, God the Holy Spirit, but also the, the, the divine and the, the, the human nature of Jesus, the way they defined it, effectively, they were, they were considered back then heretics. Right. Right. There was a time when they were considered heretics for the way that they viewed this. And the way that they viewed Jesus, the way that, that they viewed the Godhead is very, very similar, if not identical, to the way it is in Islam. Mm -hmm. Right? And if you if you consider some of just the, some of the connections to, just to veer off a little bit, um, the first person who called the Adhan, right, the call to prayer in with Muhammad was Ethiopian. Yeah. The guy who repaired the Kaaba was Ethiopian. His first... He, in fact, the woman who was with him from birth until death, who was his wet nurse, and she was with him all his life, Um Ayman, was Ethiopian. Wow. The only two languages Muhammad is said to have spoken is Arabic and Ethiopian. Okay, the wow. The first two hijrahs didn't go to Medina. The first hijrah in Islam and the second hijrah in Islam went to Ethiopia. Uh, yeah, the Abyssinian king. Is that when you're talking about? The, yeah. yeah. Oh, my days. Okay. Right, Muhammad used to listen to brothers recite the Quran in Ethiopian. Right, the the word, the Tawhid, right, which is the, the the central concept of Islam. That's an Ethiopian word. It comes from the from the Ethiopian Tawhedo, Ethiopian Orthodox Tawhedo Church. The term Tawhid means unification. So Obviously, is that from almost like the Unitarian? uh perspective that and then it's because that's that as you said that's the central concept of oneness in islam and if they've yeah, picked up that concept of, yeah so the amalgamation of all of those things which i think islam does very well right we'll see as this presentation goes on all the different gods and attributes that eventually get amalgamated into allah but even right. tawhid you're saying goes back to the ethiopian correct so yeah. you just and in fact the, yeah go ahead Go on, go on, please. I was just going to say from, from each angle that you, you're talking about it, whether it's like the closest people to Muhammad or the languages that he spoke or whatever's happening around him, there is such a heavy influence of Ethiopia. And even according to Islamic you know, historians themselves, as you said, that hijra of his companions to the king of Abyssinia and saying that that was a safe space for us. And they, well, that, it, it makes sense alluding to like the pluralistic society we mentioned earlier, but it's already kind of all coming together. Like there's definitely some causation here between what's happening in Ethiopia. And they were there for 15 years in Ethiopia. So they had time to gather a lot of this. So if you look at the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawhido Church, right, the Church of the Tawhid, mm -hmm. they, um, so the women and men are segregated. 
right. right just like in the mosque right yeah. if you have i mean you have the women cover their hair you take off your shoes before you go in they don't do pork they circumcise they have lots of long fasts understand these yeah. are practices that but that's a story for another day so starting let's to ring a bell <laughs> yeah yep so let's have a look these are all ethiopian coins okay you can see these are ethiopian coins with crosses on them right yeah. these are all ethiopian coins with crosses on them right so they adopted christianity very very early now the axumite ruler was called the nagusan Agast, the king of kings right and king azana ruled from about 320 to 360 AD, he converted to Christianity, as was verified by Aksumite coins. Now, you okay. can see the original Aksumite coins had a thing called a star and a crescent. I've oh, never yes. seen that symbol before. I'm not sure where I've... I, hold on. Look, have, you seen, <laughs> have you seen a symbol uh, like that? I'm not sure. I don't know, Lloyd, off the top of my head. Where? Uh, on, on flags, on mosques? Is the Maybe someone in the chat can help us. Where have we seen I, the star and... Because this is not the sun. In this case, in this example, this is not the sun. This is actually a star circle, like Venus. Yeah, exactly. Precisely. Guys, is, is, is the penny dropping literally for anyone? <laughs> Where literally, we yeah. So they were pagans before they were Christians. He was a pagan who converted. right? And don't forget, they used to worship the moon god al Makkah. This is the symbol of the moon god al Makkah. It's one of his symbols. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So you can see there are multiple coins here with the king, with his symbol. Okay, and here you can see again another one. So there's multiple of these coins with this symbol. And then, of course, he started to put crosses on the currency. He changed. Mm -hmm. He became a Christian. Wow. All so right. the coins completely, yeah, testify yeah. to that and the change so, and the Venus star. Yeah. So the crescent and the star, this, the crescent and the star is a very old symbol that goes back BC. That's a pagan mm -hmm. symbol to the moon god, al -Makkah. And also, who's the same as the Babylonian moon god of Sin, or the moon god called Shin, or Sin. So, Ethiopia, the first Christian state. So, they became the first sub-Saharan state to embrace Christianity. It was proclaimed the state religion in the early 4th century. However, they were Christian from the 2nd century onwards. Okay? Right. Um, for a century prior, Roman traders had brought knowledge of the Christian religion to the Aksumite mercantile network. These okay. mercantile networks spread words, coinage, ideas, inventions, stories, um, everything. Simple. Yeah. Yeah. And in the sixth century, Aksumite King Caleb sent a force across the Red Sea to subdue the Yemenis, dominating South Arabia for 70 years. The Byzantine emperor supported Aksum largely due to Yemen's persecution of Christians. We'll get more into that story. So, right. So let's look at the first church in sub-Saharan Africa. So this is from the Smithsonian. A church on earth in Ethiopia rewrites the history of Christianity in Africa. So let's have a quick look at this. Um, so archaeologists can now more closely date when Christianity spread to the Aksumite Empire. Right. So this is them digging in Ethiopia in Aksum. We've just seen Aksum, right? This is uh -huh. where we discovered Yeha, right? This dig site is not very far from Yeha. So the oldest known Christian church in sub-Saharan Africa has been found, okay, and shows its surprisingly early conversion to Christianity. This group would go on to dominate much of Eastern Africa and Western Arabia. I'm going to zoom in a little bit more, as much as sure. I can for your audience. Okay, so they dominated Eastern Africa and Western Arabia. And, of course, this structure was built around the 4th century, about the time when Roman Emperor Constantine legalized Christianity in 13, 313 CE. He did not make Christianity state religion. He just legalized it. He legalized right. its practice. Right. So Christianity arrived at an early date in the area, nearly 3,000 miles from Rome. And this find suggests that the new religion spread through long-distance trading networks. Mm-hmm. So these religious ideas spread through trading networks. The Arabs had trading networks all the way into Turkey, and they brought yeah. back the Turkish gods. And we'll see evidence of that later that linked the Mediterranean via the Red Sea with Africa and South Asia. Aksum was one of the world's most influential ancient civilizations and remains one of the least widely known. It's They're trade by camel. Sorry, yeah. On. No, it, I mean, it, it's just mind-blowing to me as well because uh, 
again with the direct like a Quranic reference I'd always been kind of as a Muslim on a wild goose chase about like the kingdom of Sheba and and the queen of Sheba and and this huge empire that she was kind of in charge of and then her almost having an empire to rival Solomon's and I was just well, like even within Western history, even at school, we're not barely taught about African empires. And I mean, let alone, you know, almost prehistoric ones that predate um, like, like Muhammad, Christ, all of that. We just never go into it. So now you're actually reading out that Axum is, it was such, it had such a stronghold and the trade network there was so influential around the world. Yet we know nothing yeah. hardly about this. And even the, the one before that, um, the, the civilization Yemen, that was Yemen, yeah yeah or was it the one that began, began with d the, there was some, there was yeah uh, maybe the, was it them the one that even preceded Yemenis? this that was found in the mountain hilltops oh yeah yeah the Sabaean empire yeah. oh yeah exactly so that there's a wealth of things happening here that we're just unprivy to yeah so the, because islam likes to pretend that that islam sort of what Generally, Islamic scholars, this, the narrative is that Islam sort of developed in this vacuum. But when you look at the history, this was like this, this place was buzzing with multiple languages and groups. We'll get in, we'll cover more and more of this as we go. I'll start adding more depth and going sure. faster and adding, you know, but, but understand this was not an isolated place. Now, certainly Arabia wasn't exactly a metropolis like Athens, but there was activity and influence from multiple different sources. Language was, was common. Okay. The, the fact that during the Islamic period, there was no written language, that's an anomaly. Because mm -hmm. before and after, well prior to Islam, there were several, several languages being used. And the Yemenis were all literate. They wrote. They had script. They wrote. Yeah. And then suddenly Islam comes along and no, nothing, nothing. So, somehow, where's the records? I don't know. We don't have any. We don't have any historical records. Isn't that just convenient? And Very shady. We'll we'll cover all of that. So you can see there, you got the cross, the cross here again, a yeah. couple of crosses on that thing. And so, Christianity had reached Egypt by the third century AD. So that's in the two hundreds. But it was not until Constantine's legalization of Christian observance that the church expanded across Europe and the Near East. And now they say that Christianity arrived in Ethiopia at the same time. There was no delay. It arrived. So it arrived in. Ethiopia at the same time as it went everywhere else. So it's on the same time scale. In fact, possibly before um, Armenia, right? Oh, wow. Okay. So you have the earliest physical evidence for a church in Ethiopia. And there were churches being built. This is like a large church, but home to temples built. Now, the temple was built in a Southern Arabian style dating to centuries before the rise of Aksum. It's built in the style of the people of Yeha. The temples reflect the influence of the Sabaeans who dominated the lucrative incense trade and his power reached across the Red Sea. The building was 60 feet long and 40 feet wide, resembling the ancient Roman style of a basilica. Remember oh, wow. the Yeha temple, 40, 60 feet long, 40 feet wide, same dimensions, same style. Uh -huh. They just took it over and converted it into a church. Right. This was a common practice, right? So this unusual collection of artifacts suggests a mixing of pagan and early Christian traditions, and we'll find lots of that. So in other words, Christianity arrives, and then the pagans arrive, the heretics arrive, the Gnostics arrive, and now they're all trying to, they're all trying to push, a, push a message because the Christian, the Christian missionaries were being very successful in converting people away from paganism, mm -hmm. getting them away from heresy and so on, right? And of course, now the pagans had to adapt their message. They had to obviously start, they started to plagiarize these ideas, push the ideas to compete. And the yeah. heretics obviously were also competing. So now you had this complete mess going on, a total mess. So there was a huge fight for what was orthodoxy back then. So now we know mm. there's evidence of the mixing. And here you see the moon god with the two horns. Right? Yes. So now you see the moon god and the two horns. Right, on that ring. <clears throat> so there was a Christian presence northeast of Axum at a very early date. And the spread of Christianity was intertwined with commerce as it was with other religions, the, even the pagan religions. And long distance trade routes played a significant role in the introduction of Christianity in Ethiopia. And they were a very important center of the trading network in the ancient world. I'll leave that there. Does that help to clarify a few things? Yes, most definitely. And I think, I mean, just up to where you are now, like the, the picture you've painted in terms of what's happening, how many languages are being spoken, the trade routes, um, the influence, 
and now just like even adapting a building kind of structure and just this marketplace of ideas is happening and they're kind of like yeah. building on what was there before um yeah this is already really starting to kind of like take shape um just just stop you for one second ultra thank you so much for your super chat g block as always my friend and secular sekai as well thank you so much for your super chat guys uh if you did want to ask a question instead of just sending a super sticker by all means go ahead and ask questions lloyd also really encourages like aud audience participation and kind of engaging you guys so feel free to kind of you know get as involved as you want to in this presentation but yeah thank you guys for your support so far and yeah we'll continue all right yeah thanks guys so hopefully i'm painted a different at least a, a lovely historical picture here to give you some background i've started to give some background so now the first hijra is the migration to abyssinia so Muslims found refuge in Christian Aksum, right, in 614 AD, round about. I mean, it, the date varies slightly, but roughly. When the apostle saw the affliction of his companions and he escaped it because of his standing with Allah and his uncle, he could not protect them. And he said, go to Abyssinia, for the king will not tolerate injustice and it is a friendly country. Thereupon his companions went to Abyssinia and this was the first hijrah. So how did you know it was a friendly country? Yeah. Good question. Right. How did you know it was a friendly country and the king would be so accommodating? Correct. So that's in Ibn Ishaq, page 146. That's Guillaume's Sirat Rasul Allah, the life of Muhammad. Right. And in Arabic, Hijra, Al Habasa is where Muhammad's followers, the Sahaba, fled the persecution of the Quraysh tribe. And the Aksumite king who received them is known as the Negus, in Arabic, the Najasi. Right. Some of the exiles returned to Mecca and made the 622 Hijra to Medina with Muhammad. Others remained until they came to Medina in 628. So they were there for about 15 years. Right. So a lot of time to absorb all of these ideas. Right. True. Very true. Um, I'm going to skip over this. I'm just mm -hmm. going to mention one small thing here. But of course, the Muslims <clears throat> do within their within the um, Sira, within the biographies of Muhammad, basically the Gospels of Muhammad. They do want to claim that they presented their beliefs about Jesus and about, you know, God and so on to the Negus, the king, the Christian king. And he believed them. And he said, yes, we have the same beliefs. But apparently, according to these sources, they gave a, shall we say, an edited version of their beliefs, one that was more suited to his ideas. Right. And he said, yes, I am one of you. You are you are one of us. But apparently they didn't give him the full picture, in which case we'd know, for instance, that they, they did not share this idea, the same idea of the same God. Yeah, because okay. um, in sorry, just to cut you off real quick, in in the Islamic propaganda film that is the message, which I grew up on, um, it's actually like one of the most you know important lines where the king says, "We are like um two rays of sunshine and like you know towards the same God, but we are just the thing that separates us is like your one ray of sunshine and I'm the other, but the source is the same." But yeah, as you said, they obviously hid a lot. <laughs> So Muslim accounts state that upon hearing these words, the Negus declared that Jesus was indeed no more than what he had said, because they said Jesus is God's servant, his prophet, his spirit, and his word. They mean something completely different when they say his word, his spirit. That's a completely different idea than what, what is meant by the Christian vocabulary. So yeah. so, yeah. Okay, let's have a look at a few Islamic links to Ethiopia. So the Christian community in South Arabia at Najran was the oldest Christian community in Arabia. Right? They were persecuted by the Jewish king. Now, I know they say Jewish, but this is not. This would not be Orthodox Jewish in any way. And when I say Orthodox, I don't mean Hasidic Jews. I just mean this guy would have been a little bit of a heretic, according to what I what I can see. He's, he's Jew-ish, you know? Okay. More-ish than Jew, right? Okay. So, so definitely, yeah. Yeah. Uh, is this uh, like some, is it, when you say heret, like Jew-ish, how in terms of like the like heresy or whatever how much are we seeing within the jewish religion vis-a-vis -vis the christian religions like is like some of them follow the book of enoch and then would they be considered outright heretics do you know what i mean just so, is there there was a huge fight on from the first century because remember all the christians were originally jews the message yeah. was originally directed to jews so they came out of a jewish culture but there was a saint paul is attacked heavily within islamic polemics Right, mm -hmm. because St. Paul eventually had to make a decision and he convinced the rest of the church fathers, the early church fathers, including James, the brother of Jesus and others who were the heads of the church in, 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 um, in Jerusalem at the time. They said, look, 
we have Jews, right? Who come from a Jewish culture and a Jewish milieu, a Jewish background, Jewish knowledge and so on. And then we've got these pagans and we now want to give the same message to these pagans. And you guys are saying that these pagans must become Jewish. In other words, circumcise themselves, follow all the Jewish customs, follow the Jewish laws, plus believe in Jesus. And he said, hold on, that that's two steps. That's too many steps. Mm -hmm. What's important is that we believe in Jesus, not that they become Jews first. Right. So he changed that requirement and said, look, and then they, they agreed that, yes, baptism, no need for circumcision and so on. And let's believe in Jesus. So so that he changed a lot of that. That's also it was not legal for a pagan to become a Jew because it was a legal status, just like in Islam. It's a legal status. Right. right? So if you as a pagan adopted Judaism, the, the Romans could throw you in jail. You could be fined. You could be hurt because of it. Yeah. It wasn't something you could just casually do, understand? There were huge mm -hmm. fights about it. And eventually they made, decided, look, we all need to be one body. We can't be, we can't be the, the Jewish Christians and then the other guys who are, you know, we, we all have to follow one set of rules. And they, they changed that. And so, yeah. So anyway, so these Jews are slightly, I would say, from what I can gather, slightly heretical. They, they are, right. you know, there's, there's, they've deviated slightly from the way. So he's generally Jewish, but there was a lot of heretical Judaism in the area at the time as well, just as heretical Christianity. And there was still a strong Christian in, Jewish influence behind Christianity of the day. I see. So, okay, thanks. So many of them were historians. Others were monophysites, more or less related to the monophysite church of Abyssinia. Monophysite, which we will know as the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawhid church or Tawhedo church, right? So... In international trade, Abyssinia was the destination of Kasei's four sons, one of his four sons, and, and also trade relations between Mecca and Ethiopia went back to the late 5th or early 6th century. And in fact, we know it went back to about 800 BC, right? Yeah. And the Arabic word Injil also resembles the, oh, sorry, Mike, you know, I'm going to fix that word now. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, oopsie, sure, go for oopsie. it. I'm, I'm going to change this because... One deal. In fact, okay, so now let's just me put all this back. Sure. Well, while yeah. you're doing that, I just want to say, Jojo Freelancer, I actually haven't got your question, but like, feel free to type it in, in the chat here and we'll put it up. All right. So, thanks. So now the Arabic word, the Injil, because remember the Injil is what they claim is the name of the New Testament in the Quran, right? So that's yeah. the Arabic name for the New Testament, the Islamic name for the New Testament. Now, of course, the Injil does not resemble the current New Testament as we know it, or doesn't resemble the New Testament. It resembles the Gnostic Gospels. Mm -hmm. So the Injil seems to be the Gnostic Gospels, right, which were yeah. rife at the time. And of course, the word Injil is very similar to the Ethiopic word, which is for the New Testament, which is one Jill. Okay. Wow. See, Injil, <laughs> one Jill, one Jill, yeah. one Jill. I'd say they're fairly similar. You know, they sound free. so the word had been introduced Very into Arabia so. by Abyssinian Christians at the beginning of the sixth century. So the generally accepted origin is Greek, Evangelion, good news, entering the Arabic via Ethiopic one Jill. You see? Wow. So okay. you've got Evangelion, you one galleon, right? In Jill. But Evangelion is not exactly doesn't exactly roll off the tongue and become in Jill. True. One Jill certainly becomes in Jill very simply. Yep. Right. So now Ethiopian, now Abyssinian, okay, Ethiopic, philologically, according to the language, the, the history of language and the structure of language, Ethiopic is the ancient language of Abyssinia. It is the most closely related to Arabic of all the Semitic languages. Oh, wow. Wow, wow, right? wow. And that would most definitely testify to what, what you're showing us with the proportion of the Quranic language earlier as well. Yeah, the Ethiopian origin. So, so the, the Christology of the Quran seems to come from Ethiopia. Yeah. At the very least. Right. So once we finish all this with Ethiopia, we'll pr pretty much focus just heavily on Yemen after this. So, sure. so these contacts, as a matter of fact, with the ancient Gez, okay? So this ancient language with which the Arabs were in contact in pre-Islamic days and during Muhammad's life, these contacts were fairly close. Previous to the birth of Muhammad, the southern portion of Arabia had been under Abyssinian rule. And of course, the story of the year of the elephant, where these, you know, Abraha, what these elephants invaded Mecca. Mecca was saved from the Abyssinian army, which marched up to destroy the city. And there were trade relations between Abyssinia and Arabia at a much earlier period than the Aksumite occupation. Friendly relations continued. And also, Muhammad sent his followers to seek refuge in Abyssinia. And Meccan merchants employed Abyssinian troops as escorts. Wow. Okay. 
right? His first nurse was an Abyssinian woman, and she was with him until his death, according to the Islamic narrative. So an Abyssinian woman was with him from birth to death. She was his wet nurse. She according suffered. to the Islamic narrative as well. Narrative. So we're not even deviating from that. Yeah. So that's apparently why he speaks Ethiopian. That's the only other language he spoke. The man he first chose as Muaddin was Bilal al-Habashi, right? Mm -hmm. Habashi. So he was a Ethiopian, an Ethiopian. And the tradition noted he was particularly skilled in Ethiopic language. Wow. Okay. And they had a Bible when he was alive. Yeah. Yeah. They had and, a Gaze okay. Bible. Yeah. And what? when it says skilled in Ethiopic language, sorry, do you, so when we talk about the writing that almost, again, when Islam comes around, they just say, you know, these, these people aren't literate in that sense. So how far do we let that claim take hold when we see, like when it says that Bilal was well-versed in Ethiopic, would you assume that he could maybe write or not at all? So I will come, so we will come, we'll circle back. Just sure. like Jen Saki loves to say, we'll circle back to that in the future. <laughs> okay, Except cool. I'm not trying to dodge political questions, but um No, that's um, fine. You can you can take that one and as it unfolds, so that's fine. That region was filled with people that were literate, that had script, that wrote. Yeah. Writing, inscriptions, even even graffiti was common. It was very common in at least seven languages. Wow. Right? Then Muhammad comes along and pff, suddenly all of this archaeology disappears, destroyed, mm -hmm. missing. All the paper records, gone. No writings, nothing for 200 years. And then suddenly, when they start producing these hadith, then suddenly Arabic language writing resumes again. But for that period, just before Muhammad and just until the hadith came, somehow all the records are missing, or a large number of them, a significant portion. But prior to that, the, the Yemenis had writing. The, the Ethiopians had writing. They wrote. There was... But the Arabs somehow who were mixed up in this like this, inseparable, they didn't have writing, just sheer coincidence, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that Very... no historical record survived. Just really, really interesting. Yeah, exactly. Okay. This is why your your knowledge and research here is uh knocking down walls. <laughs> but yeah, sorry. Feel free to yeah. continue. So we'll talk more about, so yeah, so okay, now let's, so guys, so that finishes that introduction. So I'll go on to the next section, which is now to, to focus more on Islam and Yemen, right? So I just wanted to lay some of these um, things down. <clears throat> so uh, any comments or questions in the, in the chat that I need to attend to? Um, I've got some coming through now, but I'm just trying to see if, uh, how much the question is relevant to the topic because I don't want us to be thrown off entirely so yeah you can carry on for now and then I'll just bring this up as soon as I've read it in full all right so now I want to talk about Islamic symbolism right and of course this is a mosque this is the crescent moon which as we've seen is a pagan crescent symbol and this pagan symbol this Babylonian symbol goes back thousands of years including the crescent and star all right thank you Jib now, so let's have a look at the pagan crescent moon. So the Hilal is the crescent. This is Islam symbol. This crescent moon is the Hilal, right? You'll see sometimes it's this way, sometimes it's this way, and sometimes it's vertical, right? Yeah. Um, the shape of it just depends how far north you are. The further north you go, the more that the moon turns down and the more you see this kind of axis. So as you go south, it gets like this, and as you go north, it turns like that. So that's, that's the only reason. Hilal, right? is the crescent. So the moon has 12 phases and several of those phases were named. And the moon was seen as a deity and Hilal is the name of the pagan god of the crescent moon. Hilal is the name of a pagan moon god. Wow, In fact, okay. the Arab pagan moon god. Yeah. Okay, so when you say Hilal, it's not just a word meaning crescent, it's the name of a pagan moon god of the crescent moon. So let's have a look at the Arab League. Okay, let's see. Crescent and star. Let's see. Star, crescent, and stars. Okay, crescent, and then some Arabic writing in the middle. Star. Right, crescent and star, crescent and star, star, crescent and star, crescent and star, star, star. Excellent. Lots of crescents <laughs> and stars. Okay, just sheer coincidence. And of course, let's have a look at, just out of curiosity, this pentagram on the flag of Morocco. Mm. 
Well, if you've ever seen movies that involve witchcraft or Satanism, you'll see that there's the pentagram in those movies. It features highly, sure, heavily correct. as the symbol of Satanism and witchcraft. So the pentagram is the Babylonian pagan symbol of the gods Ishtar and Marduk. Okay, wow. The red okay. is from the imams of Yemen, and the pentagram is the seal of Solomon as well. And Solomon features in Islamic history and myth. Right. So, but now you've got the pentagram. Of course, if you look, I went in online, I went and found a, a you know, a proper satanic pentagram and there we go. And I'd, I'd say they, they look fairly similar. I'd, I'd say there's a reasonable similarity between the two. Yeah, that would tell most us. definitely I'd agree. And all of these pentagrams can be traced to the Babylonian symbol. Okay. Right? Historically, all of them are traced to the Babylonian pagan symbol. Right. So the Hilal is the crescent. This is Islam's symbol. The earliest version is the Egyptian hieroglyph for month. It features a crescent above a star and it's the remnant of a lunar calendar. Mm -hmm. I know there's a religion. I can't think of its name right now that uses a lunar calendar. <laughs> oh, if I Can anyone in the chat help us out? What, what religion yeah. is it that follows a lunar calendar and has just, a just... massive month coming up, which is also <laughs> from before yeah, its time? Yeah. Now, this symbol has spiritual significance in ancient Mesopotamia. The Babylonian cuneiform word shiptu, here we go, means incantation. It originally took a form very similar to the modern star and crescent. You can see here different forms of it through history and different geographies. And it was used to ward off evil. It was incantations designed to ward off evil. So you used to recite, you know, incantations are recited. Mm -hmm. just like a certain book that I've heard of that you're apparently called the recitation, but I, I very interesting. Um, so this boundary. Now let's look at the boundary stone of King Nebuchadnezzar. He's in mention in the Bible. He's a genuine historical figure. Nebuchadnezzar one from Babylon. This is 1200 BC, roughly contains a star within a crescent right there. As you know, uh, he was a good Muslim, according to the symbol, at least. And the symbols were associated with the deities, Shin, the moon and Ishtar Venus. Wow. Okay. I mean, so, yeah. And I, I'm just things from the Quran are coming into my head based on this, but we'll 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 delve into that in a second. But Lloyd, I do have a question for you. Let me know if, if this rings any bells to you. Um one of my regular viewers is asking, so this is Abbasid Islam, right? Sir de Young, you saw Mel show on Speaker's Corner, right? Because there is a distinction between Umayyad Islam and Abbasid Islam, correct? Um, they, they just, those are different. The Umayyads was, I believe, the first major Islamic empire, a military empire, right? Political empire that pushed Islam. And then they were conquered around 750 by the Abbasids, right? Now that's Mal's specialty. However, during that time, the terms Islam and Muslim were not common terms, right? They called themselves Muhajirun. But more commonly, so only around the 900s, but about a couple of hundred years after Muhammad died, did they start using the terms Islam and Muslims. Prior to that, they were called the believers, the Muqmanin, right? And in fact, prior to that, they were called the Hanifs, mm -hmm. okay? And we're going to get into the Hanif and the Hanifan. We will get into that. So they were called the believers and they were called, and Hanifa comes from a Syriac word meaning from Hanpe, which means pagans and heretics. In other words, they were viewed as Christian heretics. And the Jews viewed them as heretics as well. So the Jews and Christians both called them heretics because they were said to be heretics of the Christian and Jewish religion. Wow, okay. okay. And the Mukmanin was an ecumenical movement which was a monotheistic religion, which basically worshipped the Christian God. And then at some point, they split off and they called themselves Muslims to, to separate themselves. And the term Muslim really comes from the, comes from the Almoravids, who were a subculture within the Abbasids. And what happens is the Abbasids were the Mukmanin, and then the Muravids were the Muslims. And then they eventually that flipped around and they generally all became Muslims to separate themselves from the Christians and the Jews to wow. create a new identity. Well, thank you, Lloyd. I, I, I think that answered the question. I hope it answered the question um, for you as well. 
And feel free to ask again if you have anything else you need clarification. But thank you, Lloyd, for that. We've got another question here um, for you. One of my other regular viewers, Stop Scamming Man, thank you so much for your support. Stop Scamming Man is saying, been reading Ibn Ishaq's book, he largely doesn't demonize pre-Islamic Arabians or portray them as super isolated or ignorant. Salman even said to have worked and studied under three Syrian bishops. Uh, so I don't know if you want to comment on that, Lloyd, or... I think that confirms that they were very comfortable with the fact that paganism was common in that era, that right. Muhammad was born into a pagan family. He, he even in the Islamic records, he worshipped the pagan gods, Al-Uzzah, right? He worshipped the pagan god Al-Uzzah. He was consecrated to Hubal, right? Hubal is simply who is just a prefix meaning he who is Baal. Um, so he yeah. was consecrated. We'll get into all of that. He he was consecrated to Hubal by his grandfather, right? Um, and he had two sons with Khadija who were called Abd Manaf and Abd al Uzza, the slave of Manaf and the slave of Al Uzza. Remember, there's the three female gods Alat, Manat, Al Uzza. Manat and Manaf are just male and female versions of the same god. So yeah, oh, right, Abd Manaf. Yeah. Manaf is the male. Right. Yeah, Manaf mm -hmm. was just with well, a pagan god, god of the star. And then you had Al Uzza. So he had a son called Abd al Uzza, slave of Al Uzza. And according to Islamic scriptures, he and his wife prayed to Al Uzza every night before bed. And he even sacrificed, according to his own scriptures, he sacrificed uh, a ram to Al Uzza. Yeah. So, yeah. and of so, course, um, the modern narrative yeah, tries no. to paint him as a Muslim from birth, literally from before birth. Yeah. Exactly. And that's why, again, the, the problem with the satanic verses and all of that comes to light. But also it's really interesting because it is only once you look into like Ibn Ishaq and things like this, where they do openly talk about um, the pilgrimage that's done, you know, that was done way before um, Islam as we know it today. Yet the exact same thing is happening. And they do form those links because I think at some level they are completely undeniable. But um, it's interesting that most lay Muslims, like even myself included when I was one, we try so hard to run away from that because for us that like goes against the very foundations of Islam. So we just go with everybody's inherent faculty is to be a Muslim, you know, as, as like that's the inherent natural state of being almost. Uh, and this is just kind of like breaking all of that down. So it is very interesting that even Islamic early scholarship has to state certain things, how they are, and their own sources testify to a lot that's being said here. It's just that Lloyd has been kind enough to deep dive and show us the exact roots of it. So yeah, thank you so much again, Stop Scamming Man. And uh, yeah. Omesh, thank you so much for your super sticker as well and your support. Thank you for being here. Sorry, Lloyd. I just want to John Stockman. I can say Afrikaner. I can from Kaapstad. I grew in in Pula and near. So I can say Nederlander. Nie, you know, I can say Afrikaner. But I can't understand. So start a part. Can I get good understand? So, so yeah, I'm just. Uh, yeah, he should. We should understand the languages we speak are similar. Um, yeah. So I think the previous comment basically showed there was a relationship with the pagan people and this new budding religion, and there definitely was also a Christian influence within mm -hmm. that. Right. And on that score, it is illegal under Islamic law to criticize Muhammad, to bring shame or to bring disrepute on Islam. It is actually illegal and it's punishable by death. Um, it is called Sab al-Rasul, okay, to insult the Prophet. Uh, the doctrine of the law of Sab al-Rasul is covered by Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. You'll find it in this book, The Unsheathed Sword Against the One Who Insults the Messenger. Notice it says the Messenger, not Allah, the Messenger. Yeah. Yeah, okay. but this, so Lloyd, sorry, that makes so much sense because, you know, all these countries uh, that uphold blasphemy, and I'm specifically looking at Pakistan here, they care more about you blasphemy against Muhammad than Allah, per se. Mm -hmm. To be honest, it seems like that's where their hang-up lies, is you, you can still get by if you kind of say something against Allah, but you say one word against Muhammad and yep. all the hell of that blasphemy law will come down on well, you. And it's this. You can see yeah. Read what you see on the screen. The first issue, whoever insults the prophet is to be killed, whether they are Muslim or a disbeliever. Wow. The second issue, killing is prescribed on him, the one who insults the prophet, and it is not permissible to imprison or show favor to him or to ransom him. So death is the only answer to this. Wow. Wow. Third issue, any Muslim or non-Muslim who insults the Prophet is to be killed and repentance is not sought from him. 
That's crazy because, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but in some instances where some people are charged for blasphemy, they do Islamically sometimes give them three days to repent. As a Muslim, you can take your words back. So, um, look, I don't want to get, I don't want, don't want to deviate too much, but just sure. briefly on Islamic law. There are four major schools of Islamic law. All the other schools are considered to be heretical schools, right? They can be dismissed, right? John Stockman, also cool. Mm -hmm. So all the other schools, so they're only the four major schools, Hanafi, Hanbali, Maliki, and Shafi, right? Those are the four schools. The rest can be dismissed. They are they do not count and under strict Sharia, right? Those people would be considered heretics and they would well be killed. Right now, unfortunately, because not everyone can be a perfect or good Muslim, there are differences within these four schools, but they're not four separate religions. So the differences is harmonized. There was a scholar called Al Sharani who wrote a book called The Supreme Scales, right? right. The Great Balance of the Supreme Scales, okay? The Nizan al Kubra. So he was the scholar that harmonized the differences between the four religions. And this became the doctrine that the scholars used to interpret why the four schools are different. And this range of differences is called, is developed in a doctrine called Azima and Ruhsa. Azima right. is strictness. Okay. Ruhsa is called, technically it's called dispensation, but it really means to relax the rules. And then there are other rules within Islam, with, within Islamic law that modify how you do this. So you can, in, in fact, quite literally within Islamic law, you can break every single Islamic law if you feel there is a need. So oh. there's literally nothing that is sacrosanct in Islamic law that cannot be violated. There is not a single rule in Islam that cannot be violated if you feel it is necessary. And that's an entirely subjective decision. Yes. So, it's, so a strict Muslim, he's following Azima. Those who are not strict are following Ruhsa. So they might do totally opposite things, but both of them earn reward from Allah because they are following the doctrine within the Sharia. So, so this book concerns the Islamic ruling upon those who insult the final prophet, Muhammad. Okay. And let's have a look at what they say within the text. The objective of this work is to clarify the Islamic ruling on this subject. That's the Sharia. They are to be killed even if they pay a protective tax in a Muslim state, if they're a dhimmi. And, okay, so we've already got this. The one who insults Muhammad is killed, whether Muslim or non-Muslim. Sharia law applies to non-Muslims as well, right? So let's go here. So let's look at the first ruling. Whoever insults the prophet is to be killed, whether Muslim or non. This is the view of the scholars. The scholars have consensus. Now, consensus is critical. Islam is not peaceful. It is a war religion. So the scholars have consensus called the ijma. Now, the ijma yeah. is the orthodoxy, right? It's what they all agree upon. Now, now, Muslims will tell you, apologists will tell you, that look, we don't agree on everything. Sure, about 20% of things they disagree on. Like, for instance, mm -hmm. we pray with our hands up here. Others pray with their hands at their waists. Does that change Islam? That is purely cosmetic, right? Yeah. So, so the one guy... See, so the one guy prays with hands up here. The other guy prays with his hands at his navel. That doesn't change the orthodoxy of Islam in any way. That is purely a cosmetic change. True. They agree on most things. And these are the things that are fundamental to Islam. So the scholars have consensus that whoever insults Muhammad is to be killed. Malik, Laid, Ahmad, Ishaq, and Ashafi also said this. The four primary scholars within Islam are called the, are called the, um, which Tahid's mutlaq, the absolute scholars, the infallible, perfect scholars. Their understanding is perfect. They can make no mistakes. And that's a longer story. The Muslims have unanimous agreement upon killing whoever insults Muhammad. It is the ruling that whoever insults other than him is to be lashed. This consensus is the consensus from the Tabi'un and the companions of Allah's Messenger. Right? Let's have a So just we'll continue just to see if this is an accident. There is consensus upon the obligation of killing such a person. They have consensus that whoever insults Allah or rejects anything from what has been revealed by Allah, such a person is a disbeliever. I don't know anyone who differed concerning the obligation of killing such a person. Scholars have consensus that whoever insults the messenger who attributes a defect to him, who does not consider Muhammad perfect, such a person is a disbeliever. You're oh, insulting Muhammad and you God. are to be killed. I mean, to be yeah. honest, the, the reason I'm, I'm even more shook is because there's certain hadith that says, even if you call Muhammad like, you know, black or dark skinned, that is considered insulting him. So this mm -hmm. goes, and, and you could die for that, but that there's so that's so problematic in itself. The, the, yeah. What's being said here, what, what the overall message is, and then the punishment, and again, the subjective nature of this, but some of these ridiculous things like that, like commenting on his skin color is 
enshrined in Islamic sources. That is the law. That is the law. Yeah. That is the last law for all time. It is the permanent, the, the permanent, eternal word of Allah. Right. Atheist so, Republic Cape Town is saying, yeah, but no, but we're moderate Muslims. <laughs> for now. Remember, <laughs> you're following Ruhsa. When do you switch to Azima? That That is the problem. Let me show you something, um, something else that's important here. You see, Muhammad, if you go into his biographies, what they call the biographies, it's a euphemism. It's really his gospels. They compete with the gospels of Jesus. It's the New Testament of Muhammad, if you want to see it that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. This is the this is where this okay so this is incumbent upon Muslims. You must love the Prophet more than all people. The Prophet said, None of you believes until I am more beloved to him than his wife, his child, his life, and all people. See, now this is taken from the Bible. If you go, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. You shall love the Lord your Muhammad more than your wife more than your children, more than your own life. You must be willing to give your life in jihad. You must love him more than everything in your life and all other people. You see, I thought Complete Muhammad was just an example to and follow. sacrifice, yeah. This is, you have to love Muhammad. You have to hold him above anything and everything. Okay. This is beyond this is what, uh, being an example now, right? This is complete deification of the man. Correct. And if you go into the seerah, you go into the gospels of Muhammad, you will see he is deified. He is deified. He exists before creation. He was with Allah. In fact, the world and the universe was made by Allah for Muhammad. Muhammad wow. is the light of Allah. Muhammad is the Muhammad is the essence that Allah used to create the world. Wow. Yeah. And, and light is attributed to Allah and Muhammad and Gabriel, I think, isn't it? They all have... Correct. Yeah. It's the nur. But don't forget, the remember, the, as I told you before, it's the nur. It's not the sunlight. It's the moonlight. The, moon the light, light of Allah, the nude, and the light of Muhammad is the moonlight. Why moonlight? Well, notice the theme. <laughs> um, right. So, sorry, yeah. just before we continue, Doorknob Head is another regular. So thank you so much for your support. Doorknob Head is saying donation to this channel in the name of Raj B. Thank you, Raj B, for your donation to this channel. In other news, I finally caught up. Thanks, two times speed. Interesting. Uh, hypo in interesting alternative hypothesis to the Petra hypothesis. Thank you so much, Raj B and Dornoped, for both your donations. Um, and yeah, as Lloyd said, most of the focus has been on Petra and like Northern Arabia and and things to that regard. But he is now taking the focus down to Southern Arabia um, with a heavy emphasis on Ethiopia and Yemen, and then kind of connecting how all of that meshes together to to lead its way into Islam. But if you wanted to comment on that, Lloyd, go ahead as well. Um, yes, yeah, certainly. Look, it's not that I'm discounting the, the Petra hypothesis. It's certainly valid. There is validity to it. There is validity to the North. I'm just filling in the blank, which was the South and Africa. And I'm going to be connecting those two. So it doesn't reject any of that scholarship. It simply just adds another piece to that puzzle. Amazing. Yeah. It's just kind of like building the picture up more and adding pieces to this puzzle. And st you stand back and you see the grand picture of Islam. So yeah, uh, you're caught up just at the right time. We are right in the midst of the Hilal crescent and we'll let Lloyd carry on. Excellent. So yeah, so we've now talked about the Hilal, right? The name of a pagan Arabian moon god on the crescent. And it's connected with Sin, the Babylonian deity, Sin and Ishtar, Venus. All right. So now, Let's have a look at the Hilal, the crescent, Islam's symbol. You'll see it here. Now you notice the Ottomans, for some reason, in 1843, decided they would add this to make it the official flag of Islam. Well, maybe those Imams knew something that the average Muslim doesn't, you see? So, yeah. Wow. You have some uh, people like you. <laughs> seem to uh -huh. your well, Dawn of Head was clarifying from what we said and said, oh, if it's additional information, even better. Yeah, that's why I thought it was absolutely paramount that we get Lloyd on because currently we see YouTube channels doing this, but you just see people veering off into different segments. If if we can get the full picture together like this, that that's amazing. So yeah, I hope you enjoy. And uh, Jaspal Bhamra, thank you very, very much for your super chat. And feel free to ask a question in the super chat. Um, I'm guessing you didn't have a question, but I appreciate your support nonetheless. And I hope I said your name correctly. But yeah, thank you. Sorry, Lloyd, back to you. No, you're fine. It's No, please go ahead and take your time. Thanks. Uh, 
Yeah, it saves my voice as well. So <laughs> I did a lengthy show last night and I have another one tomorrow. So I've got like um, a different channels. massive hats off to you. I can imagine. And you need to spread this info far and wide. So hats off. Well, thank you. So yeah, so have a look at these. this symbol. So this Islamic symbol, it goes way back to pagan times, BC. It goes back BC, right? It goes, so notice again here, the same symbol, crescent, star, star. You see the crescent here, sorry. You see the crescent? This is a pagan temple. This is the fire, right? This yeah. is the pagan fire worship. Okay, so have a look at these coins. And the symbol is found in the Parthian Empire on the coins of Phraates the fifth, right? This is around the turn of the millennium, right? Mm -hmm. So 2,000 years ago. The star wow. represented either Zoroastrian div divinity Mithra or the divinity Tishtria, right? So this was Mithra worship, right? The star on the crescent became an emblem of the Parthian kings when it was adopted by the rulers of the Sasanian Empire. The Sasanians were then conquered by, these were the Persians, that were then conquered by the Arabs. Wow, so okay. Time, they, right? In the Sasanian period, the star on the crescent was shown with the explicitly Zoroastrian elements, okay? The coins display a portrait of the king surrounded by the symbol, Right, he's got a couple of crescents around you. See a crescent, 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 right? And there's a portrait of the king surrounded by the symbol, and on the reverse, there's a picture of a, a fire altar with attendants as well as the crescent, right? And when Muslim Arabs conquered Persia in the seventh century, the Sasanian coin designs were preserved, they kept the coin designs. Okay, and reformist mm -hmm. caliph Abdul Malik. Now you'll notice if you watch, especially Jay Smith's channel, Fan of Films, you'll see he speaks with Abdul Malik a lot. But Abdul Malik, yes. this event, this originates in Yemen, right? It originates in Yemen from the Muqaddibs. I mentioned that word earlier, and we'll get into we'll go into that in detail at some point. Lots of okay. detail, very important. But Abdul Malik is a title. You're the slave of the king. Now Malik, just so you know, so be, just to give you guys a bit of a hint here. The Arabic, this is the triliteral root that's common to Semitic languages like Hebrew, and that's MLK, right? M L K, right? Mm -hmm. -K, right? Yeah. MLK, Martin Luther King, right? Mm -hmm. Malik means king, okay? It's got different spellings. We do see it like Melek, Melek, I mean, whatever. It, it's, it's all the same. It's Melek, right? The king. It means king. If the king, right? If Abdul Malik, who is the king, the emperor, if he is the slave of the king, if the king, it's not a name. Remember, Abdul Malik is not a name. It is a title. Okay? Yes. You would be Abdul True. Malik Nuria. I would be Abdul Malik Lloyd. Yes. Right? The slave of the king. But if you are the emperor, if you are the king, whose slave are you? Well, you're the slave of Allah. God, right? yeah. The God that mm. you serve. You serve the God, right? Malik is the root word of a God we all know and love called Moloch. Okay. Slave of... Molech. See, yeah. Molech. You may have heard of Molech. People sacrifice children to him. Okay. This was the pagan god, god. that within the Bible, Jesus, yeah. sorry, God was very offended and he had these people destroyed for the fact that they were were completely immoral and they were sacrificing their children to Molech. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So look, we'll get into that in detail, right? So now what you've got is this fire thing. So sorry, okay, Lloyd, just so to interrupt you there for a quick second. Is So you're saying that that Abdul Malik even uh, is der derived from the word Molek there, the god? It's one of the... It's, it's one, of, one the of the derivations. Okay, okay it's, it's one, one of the, of the derivations. Yeah, Malik means king. However, okay. you see, within the Hebrew, and remember, the, the, the Jews came first, right, with their, with their religious ideas, and clearly Islam borrowed from those ideas. They stole from everything. They, from different periods, different geographies, as they conquered, they, they absorbed these ideas and modified. They wanted mm -hmm. to appeal to everybody. They wanted to seem ecumenical or some something. Mm -hmm. But understand, okay, I'll give an example. We will cover this much later, but I want to give an example of how these words work. So the root, the triliteral root, SLM, okay? Muslims are very keen to tell you it equals salam, which means peace. Yeah. Okay? They'll tell you SLM equals Islam, which means peace. Mm -hmm. No, no, it means submission. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. I don't know how I got this wrong. It means, it means submission. Okay? Yeah. Understand, you get that a lot. That happens a lot. So that's SLM. Totally. What they forget to tell you is that, remember, Islam dates from technically the 7th century, properly speaking, the 9th, is when they started using this terminology. Before that, they were just the Mokmanin. And that's mm -hmm. another interesting word to explore. But prior, so, so this is three and this is four. 
What's the original? What's the original use of SLM? Well, SLM originally was the uh, god Shalim, star god Shalim. Wow. Two, yes, the star god Shalim. Okay, and before that, you'll notice that the root SLM, the trilateral root SLM, means. Let me see, graven idol. <laughs> Thou shalt not make thee graven idols and bow down and worship them. Ten commandments. Indeed, yes. Thou shalt yes. make no graven idols. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Graven yeah. idol. Wow, wow, wow. Okay. This is mental. Yeah, just forget I to add that little bit. I mean, yeah. <laughs> just, just missed the little minute detail there, which changes absolutely everything. Wow. Okay. So will we will we come back to this and see how this obviously you kind will. of takes shape? Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Probably in the third, if you if we if you if you're kind enough to invite me back, if your audience doesn't think I'm terrible, then uh, we'll, we'll go into detail on this in probably the third show. So okay. let me continue. I, yeah. Hopefully sorry. That's interesting. We have one yeah? question for you, Lloyd. If that's okay. In the meantime, stop scamming, man. Um, thank you so much again for your super chat and your question. Um, I have heard ac academics argue that Molech was totally fabricated by the Old Testament. Do you have any comments on that? Um, I can prove that Julius Caesar, Shakespeare, and no, no, not Shakespeare, Julius Caesar and a number of major historical figures that we all believe in are all totally fabricated because there's only like a handful of scriptures or scripts, sorry, of written artifacts that prove their existence. Now, the Bible has like 30,000 different at least 30,000 different manuscripts that attest to the Bible historically. Now, if you take the, so like if you take the Homer's Iliad, I think there's only like five documents that have different versions of the Iliad. On that basis, these, these things are complete fabrications because they don't exist because there's not enough evidence to prove them. Understand? So you've got the world's most, literally the world's most attested historical document. It's a collection of documents, not one book, it's a historical. So look, on that point, look, no, I'm not a, I'm not a historian in that fashion that I can say yes or no. However, multiple cultures, multiple cultures outside of the Bible attest to the worship of Molech and all of these gods. So this is not something that is isolated just to the Bible. It's something that is that you find in multiple cultures, the Assyrians and so on. They all talk about this god, Molech. Okay. And in fact, you might look for Molech and not find it because he also happens to have other names, names like Baal. Mm. And you can associate him with the god of the Kaaba, which is you would know as Hubal. And Muhammad happened to be consecrated to Hubal. We'll get into all of that in the future. So I can, again, okay. all of the notes, all of my papers, all of the academic work, I will provide that folder. You can go through it at your leisure. You know, everything that awesome. I have, you can go through at your leisure. I so, stopped signing yeah. on. I hope that answered your question. Thank you, Lloyd, for that comment. And yeah, I'll give it literally, you, you let you take hold again, because I do realize we have 10 minutes left of this two hour stint. So it's all yours. <laughs> cool. Yeah, let's see where we are. Let's see how far we can get. Okay, fine. So let's just continue from here. So when Muslims conquered Persia in the seventh century, Right, Sasanian coin designs were preserved. They kept the coin designs. The Muslim, this is a Muslim design here. Notice it kept this little crescent and star design. They decided to hang on to that. Mm. Yes. Okay. They didn't they get didn't rid of do, it. They said, they hey, we, this is it at all. Yeah. Yeah, they kept it right there, right on top, crescent and star. You can see the star right there. Yeah. A lovely little five pointed star right there. Okay. And so Abdul Malik replaced the fire altar scene with Arabic text but he kept the stars and crescents okay and okay right so the fire altar has now disappeared the star and the crescent are still there and now we have arabic text yeah there's a whole bunch of them one two three four just on the reverse side yeah and the front side so yeah so right so the crescent it's literally sorry room. lloyd you know like the tip of the moss minarets even today and the exact way it's positioned is literally like that second coin there the third one especially it's just uncanny oh, totally. yeah yeah so muslims like to say look man this is the the ottomans did this blame it on the ottomans and you know what the ottomans got it from the byzantines well they forget to tell you it's from the pagan byzantines but that's a that's a slight technical oversight so muslims argue that the that this crescent and star is the popularized symbol of the Ottoman Islamic Empire. Others state that it is a pre-Islamic pagan deity, a moon god. Fine, so that's the debate. Now, religious symbols are historically and theologically significant. The cross is linked to the crucifixion of Christ 
Thus, it is logical that the crescent moon has a historical and theological meaning for Islam. Yes, sir, indeed. So Islam claims to be the original true monotheistic religion of Abraham. So let's have a look. So these are all now, oddly enough, these are from Haran in Turkey. These okay. are from the first century and sooner. So understand wow. the Turks had been hanging around with this crescent and star a lot longer than 1843. For a long, long, a lot longer than that. Yes. <laughs> wow. Yeah. For at least 1,843 years sooner than 1843. The Turks yeah. have been hanging around with this symbol. So don't be blaming the Ottomans anymore. <laughs> here it is. Yeah. Okay, so here you can see here's a pagan Byzantine coin. That's a pagan Byzantine coin, right? Mm -hmm. And here we've got Baal Haddad, other versions of Baal, right? And you've got the Hittite crescent moon as well. Wow. Right? Okay. So this goes back to all of these pagan cultures. So they go, so they believe that they are the true monotheistic religion of Abraham. Yes, and a massive the claim they make. The word, yeah, the word Hanif. Now, I'll, what we can do is we can end off here. What I'll do is I'll do this slide and I'll jump forward to another slide that just adds evidence to this, right? Sure. But Hanif, the plural word is Hunafa. And don't forget, within the Quran, Allah is, is Hanifan. Allah says, I am Hanifan. Mm -hmm. Okay? This is in the Quran. Allah says, yeah. I am Hanifan. Mus Muslims, originally, before they became Mukmanin, they were the Hanif. They were the Hanifa. You get Abu Hanifa, one of the one of the great imams, right? So in Islamic writings, this is one who follows the original and true monotheistic religion, which is Islam, right? In yeah. the Quran, Hanif is used especially of Abraham. Abraham was Hanif, Muhammad was Hanif, Islam is Hanif, Allah Himself is Hanif. Okay, and Islamic. This is from the Encyclopedia of Islam, Volume Thirteen, by the way. I will link okay, all of that. I'll, I'll provide all that. Islamic usage occasionally uses Hanif as the equivalent of Muslim. And the Hanafiya are the religion of Abraham or Islam. Okay? So yeah. Allah himself is Hanifan. Right? Mm -hmm. Allah himself makes that claim. So Hanif in Arabic, right? That's the word. In Hebrew, that's the word. It's an Arabic masculine name. It means righteous person or true believer in Islam. Okay? Within Arabic today, that's its current meaning. It is agreed that Hanif is derived from the Syriac word Hanpe, meaning heathen or pagan. <laughs> wow, wow! Because I mean, look at the look at the the absolute dichotomy in this, attributing that to Allah Himself and Abraham and righteous person, where the literal derivation means pagan or heathen, the, yes. the absolute opposite of what Islam manifests and claims to be. So in the historical writings, the Christians and the Jews call the Muslims Hanif. They say, you are pagans, you are heathens, you are heretics. You are heretics, wow. right? However, the Muslims then turned around. Now look, the word Christian was first a curse that was a pejorative used against Christians. They said, right. oh, you are the followers of Christ. You are the Christians. And the Christians eventually said, hey, you know, the shoe fits, right? Mm -hmm. So what happened is here, the same thing. They were, they were called Hanifan. And they said, yeah, yeah, we are. And then they took it on as a positive term, whereas the enemies obviously had originally used it in a negative term. What is odd, though, is that the Muslim scholars also use the term Hanifan as a derogatory term to describe star and moon worshippers. So okay. they Sorry. use the term, they say, um, we are Hanifan, we are yeah. believers, okay? We are believers. However, the Muslims then turn around and they go to pagans and they say, you guys are Hanifan. You are pagans. So within yes. the Islamic writings, they call pagans Hanifan, but they call themselves Hanifan as well. Yeah, that is Which really is interesting because, yeah, the fact that because you, you wouldn't you wouldn't even want want the connotations of that linked back to yourselves um, if that's the term you're using derogatory for them. Do you know what I mean? That 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 is yeah. weird to to kind of accept that that word on both levels like that. Um, but I just, I don't want to cover that last point of your PowerPoint. So Abdurrahman, I do want to say thank you so much for your super chat. Abdurrahman is saying great work, Lloyd. So whether you were speculating on whether people are enjoying this or not, I, I very much think we have our answer. People are really enjoying this. I just want to give a special shout out as well to Derek from Myth Vision. Um, he's here in the live chat. Thank you so much for stopping by, Derek. Uh, this is actually right up your street. So thank you for being here. And um, Derek is saying this is really interesting stuff. Um, 
so yeah thank you and I hope you enjoy and this is going to be one part of a massive thing we're going to break it down slowly so I'll let Lloyd yeah. wrap, wrap up today's because I know there's yeah, a couple so I'll more wrap things up you want to tell slide us then if you want and then you can sure. take some questions and add your thoughts and I'll leave the floor open to you so I've just introduced I haven't finished that section on Hanifa we'll come back to that but I want to go here quickly I want to step ahead for a moment so let's bring up this slide so we're going to talk about so to give you some brief background in the Quran, the very first name of Allah, that Muhammad, because Allah has no name. Allah is actually a title, the God, right? It's generic. It's just a title. It's a title. Just like, just like um, Abdul Malik is a title. It's not a name, right? Allah. Now, don't forget the, the Arab Christians were also using the term Allah for the God, but it wasn't a name. It was a title of the God because the Christian God has a name. The Jewish God has a name, Yahweh, right? right? Mm -hmm. And now... The very first time that Allah is given a name in the Quran is in chapter 49 or chapter 59, right? Where Muhammad goes, oh, hey, good grief. Um, my God doesn't have a name. I've just been calling him this dude, the Lord. He, <laughs> yeah. he was just calling him the Lord. Yeah. And the yeah. Lord doesn't have a name. He's, an, he's the anonymous God, the God with no name, right? True. And yeah. Muhammad goes, oh, yeah, amnesia. So I've got to fix that. And so he calls Allah for the very first time. He calls him Rahman, mm -hmm. the merciful. Mm -hmm. What is interesting is that the Christians and the Jews of that era from the fourth century had been calling the God, the Christian God and the Jewish God of the Bible. They'd been calling him Rahman. There was, yes, they'd been calling God Rahman. This was his name, right? And okay. also there was a false prophet called Maselama who was a competitor of Muhammad's, mm -hmm. right? He was also preaching a monotheistic religion. I know, monotheistic religion. So this guy Maselama... <laughs> was competing with Muhammad, he was teaching a monotheistic religion, and the name of his god was, can you guess? Rahman? Yes! <laughs> he was calling his god Rahman. So Muhammad, the great plagiarizer-in-chief, wow. right, he decides, now let's have a look through this, okay? So let's have a quick read here. The upper classes of the Arab society went over to some form of monotheistic creed, a cult of the merciful Rahman, Rahman. often wow. called Rahmanan the Lord of Heaven, which could best be described as Hanafite. Okay? It is devoid mm. of explicit marks of either Judaism or Christianity. At the same time, from the end of the 4th century, a few explicitly Jewish texts attest an influential Jewish presence in the 6th century under Abraha, where Christianity prevailed. Okay? Abraha, this is the guy who went on his elephants. And, of course, the lead elephant, just so you know, Abraha goes, okay, so these elephants attack Mecca, right? Because they're unhappy, right? With Muhammad, they go attack. No, Muhammad, that's the year of the elephant when Muhammad was born, 570, supposedly. So Abraha, he was sent, okay, remember the Jewish king, the supposed Jewish king of Yemen was, was killing the Christians, harassing and persecuting. So the king of, of Yemen, the Christian king of, of Ethiopia, sends Abraha with a very large army and they conquer Yemen, they conquer much of Arabia, right? Abraha, he now stays in Yemen. Okay, mm -hmm. so now he gets word about this nonsense that's happening in, in Mecca and he takes his elephants, but he first goes back to Ethiopia and he brings back a special white elephant. The name of that white elephant is, uh, let us just, let, the name of that elephant is... Da, 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 drum roll. <gasps> what are we seeing Muhammad here? Muhammad is a, is a contraction of Muhammad. That's wow. the root, Muhammad. Yeah. Okay. Totally. He goes and fetches a white elephant, specially goes and sends for a white elephant, brings it from Ethiopia, goes to comes back to Yemen, and now decides to invade Mecca. Okay, And Mahmoud, the white elephant, gets to the outskirts of Mecca, and Mahmoud, the elephant, refuses to go further and sits down, and all the other elephants follow, and Mahmoud won't attack, and game over. Yeah. Okay, lovely story. But now, let's have a look here. Okay, So Arabia, so they say here, Quran 53, 49 calls Allah the Lord of Sirius. Sirius was the star god. Okay. Wow, the star wow, the yes. Okay. Sirius is the star god. Now the star god is the offspring, the children of the star of the sun and the moon. Mm -hmm. Okay. The moon is masculine, the sun is feminine. Of mm -hmm. course, in Babylon, the moon is masculine, the sun is feminine. In other cultures, yes. in other cultures, the sun is masculine, the moon is feminine. But it's switched around in Babylon, and the same happens in Arabia for some reason. It's odd, just probably a sheer coincidence, that Babylon and Arabia have the same concept of moon and sun, the mm -hmm. same genders. And of course, the sun is the star god, Ishtar, okay? So also called Sirius, right? And the lord of Sirius is Al-Makkah, Sin, right? 
And so if Allah is the Lord of Sirius, then Allah is Makkah, Allah is Sin. Allah is the Babylonian God, mm -hmm. the head of the pantheon. And now, might, might this, Lloyd, I'm so sorry, might this be the ambiguous Yasin chapter in the Quran that people have I been... I would say so, because that is supposed to be the main chapter of the Quran. It's the soul mm -hmm. of the Quran, the heart of the Quran. I'll go. So let me finish this. I'll be two minutes sure. and then I'll pause. Sure, sure, sure. So the new monotheistic God is called Rahman. Rahmanan. Some is called Rahmanan in South Arabia. And he's described as the Lord of heaven and earth. And the Quranic name Al Rahman is probably related to that. One interesting inscription, an archaeological inscription, ends after mentioning Rahmanan with the phrase Rabhad bin Muhammad. Wow. Okay. We've just seen the elephant was called Mahmud, which is a yeah. diminutive of Muhammad. Okay, mm -hmm. and Mahmoud is just a, a form of the name Muhammad. Rad had been Muhammad, which is translated as by the Lord of the Jews, by the highly praised. Damn. Okay, Muhammad yeah. is a title, it's not a name, it means the praised the one. The praised one, yeah, exactly. It's not a name, and this is in reference to the Christian and Jewish God, the God of the Bible. Now, let's add a little bit more information by the sure. Lord of the Jews. Not by the Lord of Islam, but the Lord of the Jews. Yeah. Okay. By the highly praised. Let's have a look. So this inscription, let's have a look. A final one here. The inscription ends with the invocation in the name of Rahman and of his son, the conquering Christ. Rahman. Christos. Wow. Okay. Christos. Abraha. Yes. Hold on. We just read about Abraha. Abraha's inscription contains clear formulas, which begins with the power, the help, and the mercy of Rahman of his Messiah and of his Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy oh, Spirit. Spirit. It yeah. recounts a Christian celebration. Oh, wow. There you go. Okay. So, the, so the, sorry. First of all, that, that's because yeah. there's a lot of information to unpack here, right? There's the Muhammad's rival prophet who was also knocking about and then Rahman was taken by Muhammad from him to give his Lord a name because thus far it had just been your Lord, thy Lord, blah, 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 to that effect. And now mm -hmm. you look at actually what, where Rahman comes from and what it's actually referring to. It's and Jesus. we've got the Messiah and the Holy Spirit. Exactly. And it, so this is, this is a sheer, really bad looking over, cheat, like copying a line or two from your friend's exam moving it over to yours and slapping it wherever you, you have blanks, if that makes sense. Yeah. And there's a lot more of this. It doesn't just, this is just, we've, th this whole presentation is about eight hours long. So <laughs> to cover all of it. Wow. So yeah, guys. So no, I think honestly, that was a lot of knowledge and truth bombs dropped on us today. Um, so I do really appreciate that, Lloyd. And I know there's a lot of material you. you have to uncover. And it's hard to do that in a concise way. But I really today, I think you've just set the scene so well Like I'm starting to kind of like visualize and, and, and be able to watch this narrative play out and what you're describing in terms of Southern Arabia. And it just lends to, as you said, what we know so far and what we can contemplate and meditate on about the Petra theory and all of that. As you start to put this information together, the picture becomes clearer and clearer. So yeah, yeah. I think this was very insightful today. Um, Derek, thank you so much for your super chat. Derek says, just showing some love to an ex-Muslim queen for being inquisitive and making it look good. Oh, thank you. That is very sweet. Um, yeah, I, th I thought it was about time that we take a, a leaf out of your channel's book and kind of delve into the history and like the pagan roots and all the mythicism that's kind of been embellished into Islam. Uh, even though we're supposed to see Islam through this strictly Abrahamic monotheistic lens, you realize that's not the case, as you definitely do know as well, Derek. But yeah, guys, I'm sure everybody that's listening knows about Derek and myth vision. But if you don't, please go and check out his channel because what we've done here today is literally what Derek does on the daily um, and he does it across the board and it's really interesting. So if you're into myths and history of this kind, Derek is definitely your man. Thank so yeah, thank you again, Derek. Um, also, I do have a question for you, Lloyd, that's come through to me on my phone. Uh, is mm -hmm. it okay if I pose this question to you before we- uh, Sure, I guess so, yeah. Okay. Um, 
so the question is lloyd do you know which is the oldest prover proven hadith manuscript we have and the oldest biographies of muhammad the oldest manuscript we have found and which we have evidence for i think is the question to you um uh, the oldest sira technically should be ibn ishaq ibn isham right however yeah. it was written about 200 years 150 years after the death of muhammad and it was edited so i believe ibn Hisham wrote it and then it was edited redacted a lot of it was stripped out by ibn isaac if i recall or it could be the other way around and what you find is that all of the all of the sira post that document start to add more detail they embellish and add more detail which was not present in the original so when you go the earlier you go back the less information you have but somehow as you come forward in time they suddenly start adding details that's not possible to to get with that and um the earliest there's a guy called motsky harold motsky i believe is his name he does speak of a very early collection of hadith um which dates back to about a century after muhammad but the kitab al sitta which are the six books which is derived from the jewish concept of the talmud because the sharia is just a duplicate of the talmud it's the islamic talmud it's their version of the talmud just as people don't like the Talmud, well, most people don't understand the Talmud. Um, I love, I love the way you call it the Muslim Talmud as well. I just think that that's so much better because it is. You're, you're exactly so. No, nice one. You're Daif Bukhari, Daif Muslim, and the Muslim Talmud. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. So, the, so the Jews had six canonical books within their Talmud as well, called the six books. So the Muslims, when you read Kitab al Sitta, just translates as the six books. True. So that is literally a carbon copy from the Jewish practice. And those date to 200 years after the death of Muhammad, right? Now, of course, I mean, we, we cannot take anything in the Islamic narrative literally or for granted. We, we have to question everything, right? Um, but, but, I mean, we also need to work within the standard narrative as, a, as, a, as, a, as an outline to work off of, right? So, so yeah, th those um, are very late. And also within Islam, they have a very different concept of proof. Um, oh, just to answer something before I forget, you mentioned Petra. The gods Alat, Manat, and Al-Uzza were the primary gods of Petra. True. So you cannot discount Petra because they were the primary gods of Petra as well. Um, but the um, within the these stories are very late. But proof means something different in Islamic law. You've got the ilm, the sciences of Islam, the Islamic sciences. These are not sciences the way that we view them in the Western world as experiments or a methodology to find truth. Okay. Islam has a completely different view of truth, has a different view. So proof is speech that sounds good, speech that is delivered in a way that that is sounds beautiful and it is forceful. Mellifluous and forceful, yeah. That that is their view of proof. I'd have to go into the Shariat and look in the definition to show people that. But, but they have a very different definition of proof, and they don't believe in written text. They believe in oral transmission as the primary, as the as as superior to that. And of course, conveniently, you can't prove anything from oral tradition. It's all mm -hmm. broken telephone. Touche. Yes, exactly. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. I I hope that did answer the question that you you had regarding the you know, the oldest evidence and the earliest Islamic sources that we have. Um, one, I saw another question on here about Saudi Arabia and uh, archaeological evidence, but I feel like we can hold that for a later part because we will be getting closer I'll to that. I'll pose the right? question. I can always do some research and then come back to that, you know. Okay, sure. Well, it was just, uh, well, let me try and find it. It was, it was um, earlier and it was just to do with, is this anything to do with why Saudi Arabia are trying to basically concrete um, all over Mecca and not let any uh, archaeologists excavate. So I think that was... So according to the Hadith, according to the early collections that they don't advertise very heavily, the Kaaba is where... Okay, so Adam... So apparently mankind was very tall when they were made. Adam was 90 foot or 36 meters tall according to Islamic tradition, right? So what happens is that Adam was 90 feet tall, 36 meters, and mankind grew shorter with every generation until today, yeah. right? But of course, there's no evidence of this, you know, men, mankind shortening throughout history, right? You don't yeah. have that. But also, Adam is buried next to the Kaaba, okay? Along with 70 to 300 prophets who are buried in an attitude of prayer. And according to Islamic tradition, prophets do not decompose. Yes. Okay? So there are up to 300 prophets 
all buried next to the Kaaba. Right now, you've got 300 prophets non decomposed in an attitude of prayer, plus the 90 foot skeleton of Adam, all buried next to the Kaaba. One radar screenshot, and Islam has proven we're all going to say Shahada like that. Exactly. Islam wins. But somehow they failed to provide that proof to us. I'm not sure why. Yeah. And how simple is that with today's modern modern like day technology? We don't even necessarily have to excavate, you know, but there's other ways it's if you want. Well, I mean, radar, yeah. Exactly. And, and and the world will believe you. The, if the world will see these intact bodies and a giant skeleton of Adam perfectly preserved, we'll show us. Don't do the opposite and cover it all up and build these gigantic yeah, hotels and no Rolex towers. Before the ninth, before the beginning of the late eighth well ninth century beginning of the ninth century is the earliest evidence of mecca exactly it didn't exist or if it did exist it was it was unimportant it was irrelevant yeah and exactly and and that and it makes so much sense today with the glimpses of history that you've shown us and what was actually happening in the nearby geographical vicinity um so yeah myth derek is launching an islamic scholarship video guys as soon as this live ends, which is basically now. So do head over there and check it out. Derek, I will definitely be tuning in um, and having a watch of that. So thank you so much for letting me know. And Claudius, um, cheers so much for your super chat and your appreciation. Claudius is saying thanks to both of you for this very informative work. I will have to pass that um, mantle on to you, Lloyd, because you are, I mean, you're, you're literally, you're just like a a shining light when it comes to unraveling this in this depth and the knowledge that you have, these questions you'll basically able to answer, whether it spans like centuries and, you know, different em empires and, and then even the way you discuss and your knowledge of like Arabic root words and derivations, it's not normally something that one man can, you know, is all encompassing, if you will. <laughs> As a hang up of Allah is is you literally are, I'm telling you, a bank and a wealth of knowledge. So I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with my viewers and, and coming onto my platform and taking up this invitation. Uh and Derek is also saying, Great work, Lloyd. Thank Keep you. going, brother. Um so yeah, John Stockman is also saying, guys, this stream still needs two upvotes. Please push it beyond a hundred peeps. Let's please oh. We got a hundred come through, so that's amazing. Thank you, John Stockman, as well for always um, being a great mod and uh, and just massive support. Uh, I wanted to shed light on one thing. Dawn Ahmed was saying sixty foot tall, Adam. What was the? I think it is ninety, isn't it? Ninety What's foot. Ninety foot tall. Yeah, he it's is. sixty arms. So in the Quran, it's sixty arms. They call it arms, but it's ninety feet. Right. Okay. Yeah. So just if, in case you needed that clarifying. So where is 90 foot Adam near the Kaaba? Please show us. Um, yeah. But yeah, so thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Um, please do not forget to subscribe to Lloyd's channel. It is in the description. And um, if you want Lloyd to carry on being able to push all this information out there, you can also support Lloyd on PayPal and Revolut, which both links are in the description of this video. Uh, so also go down there and show some love people and yeah, so we can get Lloyd on next week yeah. and have him coming back to, to keep this going. Yes. So yeah, I will provide, I will provide uh, my archive of books. I'll give you all of that um, that I've used, including the Encyclopedia of Islam. And I've got about 1216 academic papers, books and others that I, that I draw from. Most of those will be in the references folder. So I'll just give you guys the folder. Most of that is in that. So yeah, you guys will be able to look up this. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you everyone. I appreciate it. Nuria, thank you. Thank you, thank you. And there's Lloyd's channel again, guys, in uh, just here. So please go ahead and subscribe. Thank you everybody uh, that tuned in today and watched and for all your love and support and questions. I hope you all learned something. Um, and yeah, until next time, take it easy, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Lloyd.